Welcome to My Comic Shop History. I am your host, Anthony Desiato. That intro music you just heard was by Dan Pritchard, a.k.a. Dan from Australia. Dan has been a tremendous friend and supporter of all of my projects, and he very graciously did the uh, intro music for this season of the podcast. Uh, the only direction I gave him was to make it superhero-y, and he ran with it and absolutely killed it. So, uh, Dan, thank you very much. So, as listeners know, uh, this season of the podcast is focusing on collecting. And my goal is that by the end of the 12 episodes, the listeners have a pretty thorough and comprehensive uh, examination of what it means to be a collector, both in terms of the items that we collect, but even more so the uh, issues and collecting habits that drive our hobby. So that's the goal for this season. And we're relatively early in, but I decided that I really wanted to hit the ground running and just dive into the deep end with an episode on collecting original art which I consider to kind of be the big leagues of collecting for reasons that we'll discuss. And on that note, let me introduce my guests. So I have three folks with me here today. All of them have been on the show before. They are veterans of my comic shop history, but they've never been on the show together, so that's a first. And they are three of the biggest uh, original art collectors I know. So please let me introduce, right across from me, Phil Hussein. How you doing? Hello, everyone. Tom Darby. How's it going? And to my right, Mr. Drew Cheskin. Hello. So uh, thank you, uh, all of you, for being here today. I'm excited to pick your brains, because here's the thing. I collect slash have collected comics, trades, statues, pop vinyl figures, DVDs, but original art is something that I've only ever kind of uh, dabbled in. And much of what I know about it uh, comes from talking to you guys and seeing the collections, the, the pieces that you bring in when you would bring your portfolios into the store or post it online or whatever. So a lot of what I know comes from you guys. So I'm excited to really have an in-depth discussion about what it's like to collect original art. Before I do that, though, if you'll indulge me, I want to tell a little story. It's a quick one, but an important one. And it's one that I was planning to tell anyway. And then, um, unfortunately, it became very timely. So the story involves Darwin Cook, who um, sadly passed away. The news uh, just broke very early this morning that, that he passed. Uh, for anyone who might not know who Darwin Cook was, uh, he was a very talented comic book creator, writer, and artist. Uh, probably most known for DC The New Frontier. I think that was probably his most celebrated work, but uh, he had a tremendous run on Catwoman. He was adapting the Richard Stark uh, Parker books into graphic novels, amongst a host uh, of other works. Um, and uh, I think I speak for all of us when I say tremendously saddened uh, to hear of his passing. And, um, you know, we're thinking of him and his family and, you know, wishing them the best during, you know, what's I'm sure a very, very difficult time. But my Darwin Cook story is this. The first comic book convention that I ever went to was uh, New York Comic Con in February 2009 uh, when I was a senior in college. And one of my goals going in was to get some sketches. I had never gotten any before. I had zero experience with original art. And I knew that I wanted to get some sketches. Um, partly from talking to you guys, particularly you, Tom. And in fact, if I remember correctly, uh, you and I went to Michael's to get sketchbooks, right? We did. We did. And, and I you, was with you. Yeah, you. When you, when, when you went on your, your quest. Yeah, you really guided me because uh, mm -hmm. you, you, you were a veteran of it. And I think you were going to get probably, I don't know, your fourth or fifth sketchbook. <laughs> And uh, you told me what to get, and you were really helpful. Um, but I wanted to get some original art because I'm not a huge autograph guy. Like, they're cool for people who like them, but my feeling is you wait in line so long, you get such a fleeting moment with the person, and you get the signature, but it's like, how often are you really likely to look at it? But my feeling was, with original art, it's like, this is something I'll always have. I can always look at it and enjoy it. So it just seemed really worthwhile to me. So I get to that New York Comic Con, and I make a beeline for Artist Alley. So for anyone who's unfamiliar with, with what that is or how comic conventions work, at most cons, especially the larger ones, um, there's usually an area, often referred to as Artist Alley, uh, where artists are set up at tables and um, they're signing stuff, they're, you, know, you can chat with them, they're selling things, and oftentimes they uh, do sketches. So we're going to get into this in a little bit, but there are a lot of different categories of original art. But in this case, I'm talking about a sketch. Um, Sometimes it's a head sketch, sometimes a bust, sometimes a full body. It really depends on the artist. Uh, but so I made a beeline for, for Cook's Table, and I was fortunate. I was within the first half a dozen people there. Uh, but Cook wasn't there, uh, and he wouldn't come for about an hour or two. And I'm still not sure if he was late or if he was just scheduled to come later. But whatever the case was, I waited. And finally, he, you know, he shows up, 
and I hear one of the people ahead of me asking him for a sketch, and he goes, oh, I'm not sketching today. And my heart just sank. I'm like, oh, my God, like, I, like this was my mission for today. This was all I wanted, and he's not doing it. So when my, my turn came and I went up to him, uh, I basically threw myself on the mercy of, of the court <laughs> on, the, on the artist table, and I said to him, I was like, you know, I got my first sketchbook. I was really hoping that you would, you would be my first sketch. If you could do anything, I would, I would really appreciate it. And he was so humble. He's like, no, you don't want me to be your first, <laughs> your first <laughs> sketch. And I was like, no, I really do. <laughs> And I had seen, um, there was someone ahead of me, and when he signed this guy's book, he drew a really small, simple uh, Green Lantern head sketch. And I said to him, I was like, even if you could do that, I said, even if it's tiny, I said, I'll, I'll really take anything. And he was incredibly gracious. He turned to the rest of the line, and he's like, I'm not doing this for, any, for everybody. And then he proceeded to take my sketchbook, and he, he filled the page with a larger version of that simple Green Lantern head sketch. And it's... It, to this day, one of my favorite pieces, I have it now framed and hanging on the wall. It's so simple, but you can just see the talent. I mean, it's, there are so few lines that he used, yet any comic book fan, or even if you're not a comic book fan, you would be able to tell that it was Green Lantern. I mean, there's just such beauty in, in the simplicity mm-hmm. and the clean lines. And um, I couldn't have asked for a better first experience with original art, a better memory, a better convention experience, uh, or a better meeting with, with Darwin Cook. Um, so that was kind of, you know, how I got into this. Uh, like I said, I didn't really pursue it much beyond that. For the rest of that convention and maybe one or two conventions after that, I would continue to get art. Uh, in the end, maybe I amassed like 15, 20 sketches in my sketchbook, but that was about it. Nothing even close to what you guys have, have accomplished. Um, but for me, it kind of burned bright and fast, and then I kind of lost the interest. But for those times that I was at the cons, it was really uh, addictive. I mean, it was like a game, trying to get in line and get what I wanted and, and all of that, which I know is something that, that you guys have probably experienced as well. So that's my history with, with original art collecting. And on that note, I kind of want to toss it over to you guys. You know, one of my first questions is going to be, how did you get into this and, and so forth? But I want listeners to have a sense of who we're dealing with here, these all-star art collectors. So... I mean, if you guys don't mind, just kind of giving me and listeners a sense of what kind of what you have, like either how many pieces or maybe how much you you estimate you've spent on them or, or anything along those lines to kind of paint a picture about what kind of collectors you are. And maybe we'll toss it to Drew first since he's been doing this the longest. Okay, no problem. Uh, I started, well, the first piece I ever owned was actually something I asked a, a fellow I knew in high school to draw for me. Uh, my favorite comic book cover for a long time has been X-Men 102 by Dave Cockrum. It's Colossus and Juggernaut fighting. And you got Nightcrawler and Storm in there. And I actually asked him to do a reproduction of that cover somewhat. I said, I just want Colossus and Juggernaut fighting. And he actually begrudgingly did the piece for me. But I still have it. I think it's dated 1987. Uh, but in terms of actually getting pieces from professionals uh, as coincidence would have it it's a dave cockrum sketch of colossus fighting juggernaut from 1999 at the old uh, mike carbonara shows down at the church on columbus avenue in the city on 59th street so i picked that up uh would get a few sketches here and there uh you know would go online which wasn't as popular then as it was now obviously in terms of having stuff there but i found an uh, a dealer selling ron lim artwork uh, Ron Lim, my favorite artist. I'm fortunate to be very good friends with him now. Picked up a page from Infinity War issue 4. I think it was page 38. It had uh, Thanos and Warlock and uh, the Magus in it. It had a little image of Colossus. It had everything I wanted. Uh, but it was really 2003 when I met Ron at San Diego that I started really collecting hardcore. <coughs> I have lots of Ron Lim stuff. I've got sketches, original pages. In total, between commissions and pages, I'm probably between three and 400 pieces. Uh, I have actually sold off some recently, thanks to Marvel uh, having their entire cinematic universe based on my collection and everything going towards the Infinity Gauntlet and Marvel Cosmic and Guardians of the Galaxy, so I have taken advantage of that a little bit lately. But uh, yeah, nowadays I'm primarily original art. I don't do commissions anymore, too many horror stories, just... Not enough artists coming through, and the fact that they're charging astronomical amounts for them now is just, it's not as appealing anymore. Original art, at least you know what you're getting, you know what you're paying, it's already made, you're not waiting six months, uh, which I know is something you want to talk about later, the horrors of commissioning people. 
Yeah, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of different facets of this that I want to hit on. Uh, but just, you know, maybe to just get our terminology straight for the listeners. So I mentioned sketches before, and then you were kind of distinguishing between original art and commissions. Do you want to just kind of explain the difference? Yeah, basically original art are the pieces that are produced specifically for the production of the comic books themselves. So these are the uh, pages that are drawn uh, typically by a penciler, then an inker inks over that, a colorist will... Uh, take a, a reproduction of that piece and color it, and then that's used to produce the comic book. So this is what you open up and see on the pages, as opposed to a commission or a sketch, which is something where you ask the artist to do something specifically for you, and then either based on your direction or their just creativity, create this image for you based on whatever parameters you give them, and of course, whatever price you're willing to pay. Thank you. Professor Cheskin. Yes. Well said. <laughs> Tomo, would you like to go next and tell us a little bit about uh, kind of like what kind of stuff you have? Okay, sure. Um, out, out of the three of us, I think I, I'm, I, think I fall, um, I guess, in third place in terms of the amount of pages I have and the amount of money I've, I've spent. Um, but if I had to say, if I had to guess, I guess, um, I have around like 200 pieces between, you know, whatever's in my sketchbook whatever blank covers I have, whatever commissions I have, and whatever original pages um, I have. Um, and I've probably, I've, I've spent a few thousand on, in, in terms of um, everything that I have. Um, I think that's probably on the conservative side as yeah, far as that, estimates that's, go. <laughs> that's why like I'm saying I'm in third place compared to like, you know, these guys over here, they've definitely, you know, uh, outspent me, I think, but you know, who knows? Yeah. You have one piece alone that was more than a few thousand. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think you're that's selling yourself alone. short, yeah. my that, friend. That's true. That's true. A few tens of thousands, perhaps. <laughs> what, what are you hinting at, sir? <laughs> <laughs> and then Phil. Now, Phil, you're you're interesting because I like you guys, Drew and Tom. You guys were into this, you know, probably even before I knew you. But Phil, I kind of saw at least a little bit of you know your your evolution in this, and I remember. I think maybe the last piece of, of original art I got at a convention was that Francis Manipal painting, Painted mm. Superman, that I waited in line literally all day for, but was so worth it. I love it. It's a beautiful piece. Um, but I remember you kind of stopping by. You were very nice. You kept me company on the line for a little while. And I think, I don't know if you got some original art at that convention or what, but I feel like that was the kind of in the early stages for he you, He probably right? did. He definitely got some original art well, as, as you were waiting. <laughs> Well, that was 2010, right? That, that was probably 2010. That yeah. was my first convention, first time I ever bought stuff. The history is, you know, as a kid, I always loved art and comics. Like, I looked at Wildcats 15, which was done by Travis Charest, his first ever. And I was like, you know, I'm four, 13, 14 years old. I'm like, that'd be cool to have as an original. Of course, you're 14 years old. You have no money. But I remember looking in the back. Wildstorm used to have their own uh, original art dealership called Wildstorm Fine Arts. And they would have stuff from Preacher, um, you know, jesse pages for under 98 dollars and now if you talk about those pages you just start laughing it's like you're kidding me but uh you know i was in, was into it and then you know i saw drew's original collection as is with probably tom he is our conduit <laughs> to get into this hobby definitely yeah definitely thank you drew you're welcome yes <laughs> <laughs> but i mean he had he has such a vast collection it was just beautiful stuff and it was older original so the lettering was still on the artwork and they were using zipatones and all this wonderful stuff and yeah, I mean, uh, the New York Comic Con 2010 was my first foray. Um, I bought, I think, four pieces. Uh, one of them, luckily, was my grail. It was a Brian Bowl and Joker sketch, which came out really, really nice, in my opinion. I know he does the same shot for everyone, but I'm biased. I think mine was really the top three. But, uh, you know, I picked up a Clayton Henry Iron Man cover, a commission by Stefan Rue. And uh, my first ever piece that I picked up was by Matteo Scalera. He did an Omega Red. And I still have that, you know, you might sell anything, but sentimental values, you can never get rid of that. Uh, in terms of value, no comment. Um, <laughs> I'd rather not disclose, you know. But, um, you know, it's the same thing. I started out with commissions, and then I gradually moved to original arts because, you know, it's a gamble with commission. You don't know what you're going to get. With original art, with published pieces, you know what you're getting, and, you know, it's consistent. And then, you know, it depends on how expensive you want to make the hobby at the end of the day. So... Just try yeah, to there's definitely degrees of it. Very true. So yeah, can you can well I know you don't <laughs> want to say how much do you think they're worth, but mm -hmm. I mean, can you give us an estimate of how much you think you've spent? <coughs> ballpark. Just ballpark it. Mm -hmm. Couple of 
thousands, tens of thousands, <laughs> <laughs> let's tens just, of thousands. Let's just, let's just leave it at that. I hope my wife's not listening. She was here. <laughs> It's, you know, but, uh, you know, you pay for quality. I mean, you do your best to try to find the the up-and-coming artists who are kind of cheaper. And, we, of course, that's going to be a future topic. But, you know, when you find the consistent guys, you know you're paying for quality and you're going to be paying. So, and we'll talk about more about the other collectors, too. I'm going to try to de- defer some of it to the more expensive guys. I'm just a small fish in the pond. One second. We have a very modest group here today. <laughs> but, <laughs> but so now you mentioned, you know, your earliest pieces, but then mm-hmm. what was sort of the tipping point for you? Because you, I mean, again, you got like full on into this. That was probably, I would say 2011, early 2011. I really was into uh, Olivia Coppel's art and his rep, who I'm actually very good friends with now. Um, he has on his website all this great art. And I saw this beautiful piece from 2010 that never got sold. And it was stunning. And it was moderately priced, and I was like, you know what? Let me pull the trigger. I pulled the trigger on it. The guy's like, congratulations, that's been turned into a cover, and I don't know why no one's bought it. I'm like, well, this just appreciated in value a little bit more. Is this your Thor piece? Yeah, the Thor piece. I didn't realize they made it into a reprinting of a cover, and automatically, they know that's just going to sh- shoot it up. Who drew it? Uh, Coppel. Oh, Coppel, yeah. He did a double page, but then Marvel was like, oh, this is actually pretty good. We'll use it as a reprint cover for like issue four or five of the new run. And then, you know, once I got a little bit more money, you know, uh, Dale Keown is my favorite artist of all time. I started contacting him directly, and you know, it was always very tough because he always there's a guy in Canada that has the Hulk cover market cornered by Dale Keown, and every time I would email him, he goes, "I'm sorry, I sold it, sold it." He goes, "You know what? Um, I have pages from Pit Number One. You want to buy them? I'll give you first dibs." And that's my childhood favorite book. You know, growing up in the '90s, the '90s image craze, and then from then on, it was just that's where the addiction really started. <laughs> I'll, you know, it's a collection, sorry. Well, do, that's a good, you bring up a very interesting point. I mean, do you consider it an addiction? Um, if if it affects your life in a, you know, where you're financially putting this as a priority, yes. So you have to stay grounded. You have to learn to say, you know what, I'm not going to do this. Um, there was a special edition show. You know, there was pieces left and right because there were a lot of great artists that, you know, their tables were empty. You could have bought stuff. But it's like, you know what, I had a budget and I stayed within that budget. Once or twice I've slipped, I'm not going to lie, but I think for the most part, you have to stay very disciplined. You have a budget, go with it, stick with it. Tom? Uh, Yeah, the reason why I'm smiling here is (laughs) Drew and I were at a Heroes Con um, a few years ago, um, and I did not follow my budget, um, in which I was asking Drew for money (laughs) to feed my addiction. I think to feed you as well. <laughs> and, and that too, exactly. And to get me home. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So um, th- there's definitely been some some times where you, you it, it's too hard to resist the urge to buy because it's it's like we all say, if you if you hesitate, it's it, it'll be gone in an hour. And I think that's, you know, such a critical piece of all of this. I mean, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, I imagine a big draw, no pun intended, of, of this hobby is getting something that is rare i mean beyond rare I mean, it's one of a kind you know so yeah i mean i think the whole hesitation kills uh <laughs> it's so true it, it i mean really the guy here behind you could could totally just snatch it up if you mm-hmm. pass it up the next guy will get it same you can come back 30 minutes later and it'll be gone same thing with drew and your thanos piece with jim chung yeah i mean uh that's the draw for me to the you know starting with the commissions and then going on to the original art is that it is unique and that's really something that, uh, as you mentioned earlier, there's the progression from, you know, you could say toys to comics to expensive comics to art and this and that. And one of the things that made me sell my comics, and I had a nice Silver Age Marvel collection, I sold the entire thing, is that everywhere else you looked, everyone had that same Marvel Silver Age collection. It's like, hey, I've got a... You know, I just got it picked up a really nice, amazing Spider-Man 50, you know, Kingpin, CGC, whatever. So I was like, hey, I got one too. It's like, okay, so what's the big deal about that? What's, you know, and it takes up a lot of space. Artwork is unique. If you have the page, then you've got the page, no one else. If someone else has the page also, something's going on. Yeah. <laughs> right. And not only if you have the page, but sometimes if you have the book, Right, Phil? Oh, yes, yes. So, Phil, you did something that I I haven't encountered anyone else who's who's done this. I'm sure there are others out there, but within our circle, at least, you, well, tell us what you did. Right. So, um, there's an artist in question. Um, their name will remain anonymous since I'm trying to be a nice person. Um, I commissioned them for a cover quality commission of a couple of images. I mean, I read the book growing up in college. I loved it. 
And I inquired, I'm like, hey, do you do commissions? And they're like, yeah, sure. I'm like, okay, I want this. Can you get it done? Absolutely. I made the amateur mistake of paying them in full. Uh, just as a collector, just a heads up, sometimes that's not a very smart move. So I waited, you know, a couple of, two years, kept getting the runaround, runaround, and I thought maybe I could entice them by buying original art from them. So I bought a few pages, and then I did something astounding. I bought an entire interiors of a book, which is about 20 pages. Hint, and you can tell it's a DC artist. Um, given that, you know, I thought, hey, maybe this will get the something going. Nothing, nothing. So after four and a half years... Um, I said, you know what? I think I've given you an interest-free loan for long enough. You need to refund me my money. Now, the funny thing with this artist is, uh, so I got my money back. Now, the art that I held in my hand, this artist has a reputation that many people he's screwed over. They get so disgusted by the art that they have of him from previous transactions that they just unload it because they just can't fathom looking at it. And that's the same thing that happened with me. Uh, I basically traded in about 25 pages of this person's artwork, including that full book, got cash and got some pages from um you know even only three originals but for me those three originals and the cash that i got personally was worth more than the experience and dealing with this person um you know if you go on forums there's a forum that has 20 sub pages of just people bad mouthing this guy because you know it's not just being negative for the sake of being negative you know you build a relationship you feel so great about art you know like you it's a moment in your life right and then you get to meet the creators and you realize they're not as great <laughs> as the story behind it. And you're just like, you know what? Ugh, I can't deal with this. So, Well, I guess that brings us to you know, a big piece of what I wanted to hit on today, which is dealing with the artists, which obviously is a big piece of this. Mm -hmm. um, how, I mean, you guys have had a lot of experiences with this. How often are you dealing with the artist directly and how often are you dealing with an agent or rep of some kind? Whoever wants to take that first. It's... There's no rhyme or reason or rule to it. Uh, a lot of artists like to deal with everybody on their own. A lot of people don't even want to deal with it. You find a lot of artists that really aren't social people, which is probably why they sit at home drawing comic books to begin with, as opposed to having come up with something else to do, which is a little bit more social. Um, I find that dealing with reps is much better because they're purely business they know that if they aggravate you, you're not going to buy anything. That if they have a bad rep, maybe no one else is going to buy stuff from you, them. Comic book artists obviously make money for drawing the artwork. And a lot of them as such don't consider the artwork valuable in and of itself. They just don't care. So a lot of people just sit on their artwork or when they sell it, they're not too serious about it and this and that. I would always rather, for the most part, I would rather deal with the artist directly because you're not having that markup from the dealer. Right. But the dealers are always easier to deal with in the grand scheme of things because their job isn't to draw the comics, it's to sell the artwork. So payment's usually easy. Shipping is usually done very professional, very safely. It gets mm -hmm. to you, mm -hmm. you know, and they want your business again. So, um, yeah, there's, there's, I don't know. If, if you guys have had different experiences, it's just... Whoever you talk to, it's just different for everybody. I mean, personally, for me, I, do, I like dealing with agents better because uh, I'm not much into eBay and whatnot. So there's always a, a fear of fraud. Whereas if you're actually going through a dealer, you know that they are representing them. You've seen them at the conventions, etc. And yeah, just the expediting of the shipping, etc. It's so much easier. I've bought artwork from my favorite artist. He was one week late because you know he's got deadlines. They have work to do. You know, they're sitting. 18, 20 hours a day at the drawing table, you know, they'll always have some sort of excuse. Whereas these guys, they house the artwork with them, you know, by themselves and then they can ship it and whatever. So I'd like dealing with art, uh, the reps. You can build a relationship with them. You get better deals. Um, you know, I work at a table at one of them in New York. I enjoy it. I just get to hang out with people. You see all these artists come through. They're like celebrities. It's, it's a lot of fun. And yeah, I think personally dealing with reps, their reputation's on the line. And, you know, as, you, as Drew said, it's a business, so they're not going to try to tarnish their own reputation by being slow at, you know, delivering the product. What has your experience been? I know you, you work a lot with a lot of the, and this is something I wanted to get to a little bit later, but you work with a lot of the up-and-coming guys, so do you find you're dealing more with them one-on-one -on -one as opposed to with reps, or what's so, your experience So, been? So my, my feeling with reps is um, I agree with what Drew and Phil say, um, about them being professional and about them wanting your business. I totally agree with that, and that's great. But for me, um, some reps have rubbed me the wrong way, where they're pushy, mm -hmm. um, 
sometimes like they think that you aren't going to buy anything. So they kind of give you the brush off. And I take things very personally, as you all know that. And if there's like a, 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 a hint of like, you know, disdain or negativity, that's it. We're, we're, we're done. Um, but me, per- but I, I agree, you know, that they, it's their job to sell you the artwork and they're, you know, they're professional about it. They, they get things done on time, which is great. And that, that's, that's totally, you know, fine and all. But for me personally, I rather deal with the artists. Um, I'm not into buying the finished pages. I'm into the commissions. So what I do is I kind of like pick an artist that I like. Um, I also try to do my research on them. Basically try to, you know, is this guy, is this guy like reliable? Is he going to get it to me on time? Um, within a good, within like a, a fair price range? Um, is, is, he, is he accommodating towards me? Because anything that doesn't go through is going to be, you know, forget about it. Um, there was a Rob Liefeld incident that I had during one of my first shows. Um, and I, I felt that he, when I went, to, went up to his table, I felt that he didn't want to deal with me. And I, I was kind of turned off by that for a few years. <clears throat> what, what was he saying? He didn't say anything to me. Oh. He was talking to everybody else. <laughs> and I, I was trying to ask him questions. And, like, he just, he just you know, he didn't, you know, he, he just didn't have the time to, you know, talk to me personally. He wasn't Which engaging enough. Wasn't engaging enough, exactly. But then, like, you know, so there's a few years of, like, you know, I'm not going to try to bother, you know, trying to get something. But then, I guess, a few years ago, uh, a few a few years later, um, I tried again. And total 180 experience. Super talkative, super friendly, super accommodating. Gets gets your, your commissions done on time, and they were fairly priced. One of my favorite pieces is a domino that he did for me. Um, and I wouldn't sell that for any amount of money at all. It's a f- fabulous piece. Um, he was like, you know, I-, I was super happy to do it for you. You know, I love X Force and everything like that. So it was, it was a great experience. And since then, like, I've gone to his table. He's remembered me. He doesn't know my name, I, you know, but that's that's okay. I'll forgive him for that. <laughs> but um, but in the like moving forward, it was it was a great experience. And you know, as you said, with going back with the up and comers. Um, I definitely try to, you know, try to find who's like the next big artist because um, I read all like, the image and the Aspen book, all the indie books. And, you know, the artists, you know, they start off on the ground floor with that. So they're not going to be on a Marvel and DC book right away. So one of my good friends, Ken Marion, uh, definitely an up and comer drawing for DC now. He's going to be a superstar if you haven't already noticed. Um, I've been friends with him for like five years. I have tons of artwork by him. Um and he's he's a, he's a great friend, and I work the tables with him at his at his at his booth. So I'm his official art rep, I guess you can say, while we're at the con. So you know, I but I prefer working with the artist, you know. But you gotta do your research. You gotta see who who you vibe with, who gives you, you know, um, you know, who 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 can accommodate you, and who does who who, who does right by you, basically. Right. Yeah. One thing to be cautious of. I don't even know cautious, but aware of is. Make sure that when you read either the artist or read the dealer you're dealing with, that they don't think they're doing you a favor by selling you something. A lot of these people, to me, seem to feel very entitled. Think, well, you know, I know you're paying me to do something, but you should just be happy and willing to do something for you at all. And these are the artists that take money, don't bother delivering, you know. And there's, in all fairness, there's a lot of collectors out there that will say, I'm afraid to name names because I'm afraid I won't get the artwork, this and that. And it's completely ridiculous, which is why I've moved on away from commissions to original art because I've always told people, I will not hand over a dime to anybody. I don't care whether I'm commissioning or buying something until I see the finished product. I'm not going to. Mm -hmm. I've always said they want my money more than I need their art. And, And when you listen to how many artists cry poverty and they don't have any money, believe me, it's true. If they don't want to do that, if, if they're so confident in their artwork, if their artwork is so great and so valuable, that even if you screw them over, they in theory should be able to sell it anyway and make their money. Now, I'm not talking about your, you know, requesting a commission of the Pillsbury Doughboy with the Infinity Gauntlet, which no one else is going to want. Even I wouldn't want that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying that if, you know, if you're going to someone like uh, Adam Hughes and saying, look, I want, you know, Wonder Woman or something – you know, you shouldn't have to pay up front because the fact of the matter is that when he gets it done, either the person asked for it's going to want it or if they don't want it and they screw him over, he's going to be able to sell it and get his money. 
So sure. that's the one thing I always tell people when they're buying artwork, the horror stories. And I paid somebody, I didn't get anything. I said, never pay. I said, you don't pay a contractor for doing the work in your house until they're done with it. Why on earth would you pay this artist for doing work before he's done with it? You don't need it that bad. Find something. You know how much artwork there is out there? It's like thousands of pages every month from new comic books coming out. Tons of artists that want to do something, that want your money. They'll do something for you under your... You don't need to go to these guys that feel entitled and think, you know what, you're lucky that I'm deciding to do your piece. Give me the money and I'll do it when I feel like it. It's just not worth it. Just don't deal with people like that. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. And for yeah, anyone who's looking to get into this, I mean, you know, heed heed those words and, and you know, the other advice that's, you know, being uh, suggested here. But So what is the common practice, though? I mean, most artists that you guys have dealt with, I mean, like Drew, now you have your policy, you won't pay anything up front. But, I mean, typically, how does it go? Do they typically require half down or I mean how does it go I mean for the most part the ones that I deal with I, usually I go through artist reps and reps <laughs> never take money 100% beforehand because they know that their names on the line if God forbid money's lost you know they're at fault so what they do is you know you put your name on a list and if you go to conventions obviously this is an example you know if it's done then you pay when it's completed so for the most part I've seen that I'm the moron that basically paid the artist in advance so that's just me you know learning the hard way about that but yeah, for the most part, most artists might do a 50% deposit, sometimes 10%, or just give them $50 and then, you know, just to know that, you know, you paid and you're committed. Because exactly, artists, yeah. artists want to see that as well. They want to see that, hey, do you really want it? You're just like, oh, I want to put my name. If it gets done, he might flake. So it's like, I need a d deposit from you. They need a guarantee, Ex some sort of guarantee. Exactly. So smarter artists who are consistent would ask for a little deposit, but 100%, no, never seen that. So typically, what's the procedure? Like, I'll toss it to you, Tom, like, because you're in really into the commission. So if someone listening to this says, hey, I'd really like to get a commission of this character by that artist, I don't know where to start. Where, what would you recommend they do? All right, so here's what you have to do. You need to, you need to figure out which artist you want to see first. Go to their line right away. Go to their line right away because if you're, if you're first, you're more likely to get you know, a piece. Again, it also depends on like the show length. If it's a one day show, you better be number one or else you're, 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 you're fucked. Um, four day show, you know, you have, if you're, you know, coming in, you know, maybe 10th depends. It, it's, it, it's still, you know, decently likely that you'll get something. But um, what you would do is you would approach the artist and usually they have like options of what they'll do, like head sketches, half bodies, um, full bodies on 11 by 17, 11 by 14 in a sketchbook, uh, a nine by 12. So sizes and like body type is definitely a lot of, you know, there's a lot of choice out there. Pencil ink, colored. Pencil ink, colored. Exactly. There's, to there's tons of options, but again, it depends. It's different for every artist. Um, so what you will do is basically, um, tell the artist what you want. They'll either say yes or no. Uh, they'll put your name on a list if they require a deposit, you know you, you have to, you know you have to pay, or else you don't get anything. Um, some artists do require um, full payment. Um, I've been lucky enough to have done full payment, and I've gotten my piece. Um, There's a great story where I commissioned um, Eric Balsadula, uh back before he was like you know the artist, the superstar artist he was today, and um, I hounded this guy throughout the night, literally three o'clock in the morning. I was calling this guy. <laughs> Um, I commissioned him like the second to last, no, the last day of the show. And he was like, yeah, I'll get it done for you. No problem. So I, I paid him, I paid him like maybe like 79% of what he wanted. And he was like, um, here's my number. Uh, and just call me periodically throughout the day he and, and the evening. He gave his number to the wrong uh, guy. He, he set himself wrong. up. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, the end of the show, he was like, I'm not done. Just give me a call, you know, in the evening. So I called this guy. 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 12.30, 4.30 a.m. At least you're consistent. <laughs> did you, yeah, but did you go to sleep and wake up, or you stayed up the whole night? No, no, I, I, when I woke up, I would, I would call him. Um, and, and he would, like, you know, he would answer, like, oh, I just got, I just got home. <laughs> I just got to my hotel. I didn't do it yet. Call me later. So finally, I called him at 6.30 in the morning, and he was like, yeah, I got it done. I got it done. I imagine, um, though, that that is an issue for a lot of these guys, especially, you know, when you're in a convention situation like it's that. It's tough. At it's the show, super tough. They're doing signings. They're meeting people. And then after, they're going they're to going parties out. and stuff. They're going mm -hmm. out. Yeah, they're going to socialize with, with, their, with their friends. Definitely. 
So, you know, I, I definitely see, you know, um, people being tired and not being able to do it because they're just f- it's physically exhausting. But um, but he was good enough to get everything done. Um, I met him in the lobby of his hotel. We hung out, talked for a little while. Um, I got the piece. I finished paying him. Uh, but again, like, you know, uh, imagine, you know, someone not getting their piece and they've paid almost the entire amount. So the horror stories are, are definitely true. Is it always cash? Do they take check or credit card or anything? Mo- most most cash. Um, some of them who have the square readers take um, take charges, but that that's that that's not you know super you know um, common common. Yeah, exactly. con- conventions tends to be a very very cash business. Yeah, so it's just easier. You know what you're getting. By the way, the uh, your next movie, which is an idea that I've had for years, should be called the Comic Cons. Who figure out a way to steal all the cash from a comic book convention? Because you know, that's a great heist movie. Yeah. San, San Diego, San Diego Comic Con. You got twenty, thirty thousand people on the floor at any given time. How much cash is there? It's got to be millions of dollars in cash. So well, if, give you me figure, ideas. if you could figure, I know you're just crazy. if you could figure out a way <laughs> to to pull off a heist of everybody, the Comic Cons, I think it'd be fantastic. I like it. The team is led by Jeff Wong. There you go. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> So one more follow-up question for Tom, because, uh, again, I think, you know, people might, and I'm curious, and listeners probably curious, too, about the prices for, for a lot of these things. So, again, keeping it in the realm of, of the commissions, um, I mean, at least for the stuff that you've gotten, I mean, what do you typically spend on an, on an average commission? I know there's such a range, depending such on, a range, yeah. again, head, bust, full body, and all of that. So let's say you a full body, like, penciled, inked, and colored from oh, an the artist. Whole, you, the whole shebang. Yeah. Like, right, from, from an shebang. artist you typically deal with, like, what would that run? Um, all right, I'll give you an example. Tony Daniel, uh, image artist back then, uh, now superstar artist for DC. He practically runs the Batman department. He did Batman, Justice League. He's done a lot of stuff. Tons of stuff. Super nice guy. Love him. He's 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 amazing. Amazing artist. Um, so for a full body on eleven by seventeen, inked and colored with Copic marker, six fifty. Okay, six fifty. Um, black and white, he'll charge maybe like 500 Again, full body on 11 by 17 11 by 17 is the typical size that comic uh, art is drawn on. It's, you know, I, to me, like, you know, I go 11 by 17 all the time because it goes in my portfolio, looks super nice. Um, but again, like the price-wise, heads typically can go for between 50 and 100 busts 150 to 200 and again like you know if you get inks colors it's going to cost you more yeah one of the things that always bugged me probably bugs a lot of people and one of the reasons i stopped getting commissions is because you'll see someone who's never drawn comic books at a show trying to charge those same prices arguing that well i spend just as much time on it as they do so why shouldn't i get charged the same amount Whereas obviously, like anything, like in sports or, or movie star, who you are is just as important as anything else. And typically speaking, I guess people would argue there's a correlation to the more popular artists to you know the quality of their work, or as I always like to say, the consistency of their work. Someone like Jimmy Chung, Capel, uh, Arthur Adams, Adam Hughes, you basically know that what they're going to draw you know what it's going to look like they're so consistent there's not really a, a darwin cook you look at his artwork you know it's darwin cook jim lee jim lee you know Silvestri. just just all these guys turner turner rob R. liefeld R. you don't know <laughs> as funny as it sounds sometimes yeah you know you can almost certainly tell it's rob liefeld but it, all this you know every captain america isn't going to look the same nice. um but yeah, but those actually those prices don't seem so unreasonable, especially considering his popularity. I yeah, for Tony Daniel prices. anyway. Yeah. I'm I, I've definitely paid, you know, close to twelve hundred for the same thing, by just by a different artist. And what about someone who's kind of more on their way up, like a Ken Marion? What what, what would he what does he typically charge? Uh, Ken actually raises prices because um, you've been doing such a good job for him as his rep. He can charge more. Totally, now. totally. But uh, Norman Lee actually. Um, you know, told him that you're charging too, you're not charging enough for your pieces. Ken usually would um, charge $800 for a cover. Norman said, sell for 12 
and someone bought a cover. So now, just from that one sale, that's the standard. Which cover did you buy? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Not I, sir. Not I, sir. Uh, building off of Drew's point about the quality, uh, I guess this isn't so much an issue if you're buying a page. You, I mean, you've already seen the finished page, so you know what the original one should look like. Um, but when you're getting a commission, what do you do? I mean, for you, Tom, specifically, what do you do if it's not quite what you were hoping it would be? Um, I mean, I know one of the things you yeah. have occasionally. I mean, some yeah. of your pieces are like ex artist with Tom Darby because you'll you'll kind of get in there and you'll you'll tweak it a little Bef- bit. But before before I get to that, um, I'll 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 just comment on if you get a piece you don't like, um, it it can go either one of two ways. Either you're screwed and you're gonna and you're gonna live with it. That's me. Or or you can ask the artist, hey, listen, can you you know you, you forgot to do something? Can you fix it for me? Um, with Tim Seeley, he forgot to draw pupils in a person's eyes. That's and I was I was just like, you know, mistake. hey, hey, Tim, can you fix that for me? He's like, oh my god, I'm so sorry, and, and he did it right away, right for me. So right. most of the time, it, it can it can definitely, you know, they're they're happy to fix it and, and, to, and to make it look like the way you want it to look like, you know, because again, they want the good reputation. They don't want right. They don't want you going on Facebook saying, you know, such and such is an asshole. You know, he forgot to draw, you know, um, a face. And he refused to like you know fix it for me. No one wants that reputation. I think it's the same thing that Drew brought up: consistency. <gasps> when you have certain people, I'll drop my only one name. In my opinion, is Umberto Ramos. You know, if you get something from him, it's going to be consistently well. He tr- pencils, inks, colors. I have a Green Goblin from him. Just you know, once again, from a childhood memory. Oh, nice. And when I saw that, I mean, I was just smiling ear to ear. I showed it to everyone. Everyone's like, yeah. Th- it's Umberto. You know, when you commission him, there's, you know you're going to get something because he just has a reputation of being a great artist and nice guy to boot all as well. So, yeah, I mean, for me, that's always a thing. They've got a history. They have a track record. New guys, it tends to be, you know, it could even with veterans, as you said, you know, it's a hit or miss, but you always try to go for the guys that are consistent. Unfortunately, you know, that's the one where you have to beeline as soon as the convention door is open. <laughs> you have to get to be the first guy or whatever, you know, talk to friends of friends to try to make it happen but commissions that's the only thing you can try to minimize your risk is by going with the consistent people so i mean if it's if it's not um to what you were hinting at anthony was um if there's something missing from your piece um you can either have another artist that you're friendly with fix it for you um which ron has done on a few occasions where i've gotten pieces and I was just like, hey, can you make this person's hair a little bit longer? Like, you know, there's like, you know, little, little subtle tweaks. And I mean, you wouldn't know the difference. I could sell you a piece right now and you wouldn't know that it's, it's such and such artist along with somebody else. You wouldn't know. Yeah, there, there's definitely a difference between a piece that was poorly done versus there's little details that you as a fan want included that aren't there. Right. Um, so I've received a number of pieces uh, where admittedly I've done a little touch up on my own just because as a fan these are things that you notice and you just look at the piece and you're like I can't believe that's not there like I have a a number of pieces that have Colossus in it and he's got all those lines all over and he's got those lines on his fingers too and I've received pieces where like nine out of the ten fingers have the lines but on one finger they're missing and of course I'm drawn to that so (laughs) I went and did a little line you know little things like that and artists generally don't mind you saying, hey, can you do me a favor? I'm tweaking it. Because they know that you're commissioning the character because you like the character. I'm a huge, And their art. And their art. I'm a huge Thanos fan. <clears throat> Everybody who knows me knows that. Um, and for years and years, people would say, well, you know, who is this Thanos character? Now, of course, everybody knows who Thanos is because of the movies. But I always tease Ron because the Infinity Gauntlet, per the comic books, is on the left hand. That's where it is. And he constantly puts it on the right hand sometimes. And I just tease him, like, wrong hand. He'll actually look at me, if I'm sitting there with him, left hand or right hand? Left hand, Ron. <laughs> so he'll, he'll put it on there. But, so it's, it's kind of interesting that even the artists who do this stuff, for the, it's a business for them. They're, they don't typically love the characters the way that the fans do. They're certainly not rabid about their work yeah. uh, the way that you are. So... Um, again, oftentimes they don't mind if you ask them to make a few little changes here and there because, again, they're not thinking of it to that detail. It's what they do. Now, that being said, if you commission somebody and 
lay out the plan and say, this is specifically what I want. These are the characters. This is the costume. The these pose. are the poses. This and that. Yep. And you realize when you get it that they just completely forgot, didn't listen, didn't pay attention. To it. I don't think there's any reason not to go back and say either redo it or I want my money back. If they do exactly what you wanted, but it just didn't turn out great, and you're like, yeah, yeah, I've, I've seen better stuff. And maybe that's because whoever inks them in the comic books does a great job of inking, and maybe just their pencils aren't that great to begin with. Or it's not a character that they've drawn before. Yeah, exactly. Then you just sort of live with it and say, you know what, that's the risk you take getting commissions, is that it's it can be hit or miss depending upon what you're trying to get. Yeah. All excellent points. And, you know, tossing it back to you, Tom, with the commissions, I mean, how often do you have the artist draw the character they're known for versus having them draw someone that they're not typically known for? Yeah, like, you know, for me, um, I, I, I do my best to try to match up which artist would draw um, characters that I like because I'm not going around. I'm not asking for Wolverine. I'm not asking for Batman. I'm not asking for Superman. I'm, I'm looking at, like, you know, I want to spawn I want a grifter. I want a zealot or something. Um, so if, if I see an artist that I like, obviously I, I'm drawn to like the way they draw like women, let's say. So if I think they can draw, you know, a, a good looking, you know, female character, I'm going to say, hey, listen, what do you think about drawing Witchblade for me? And typically I do a good job like matching up if they can if they can handle it. And, you know, so you, you, you have to do your homework on that. You have to make a, a good, educated, you know, guess on what do you think they can do based on their past work. Do they ever say no? Or are they ever like, eh, I'm not really comfortable with that or mm-hmm. I don't think it'll come out right? Yeah, that's happened. That's happened uh, one time and uh, I've scorned this particular person, <laughs> Shane Davis. Oh boy, um, names are dropped. I mean, you I mean, know what's so funny? I, mean, I wasn't even trying to set you up for that. I didn't. Yeah, right. <laughs> I really you knew wasn't. It. No. You knew it. You knew I was going I didn't know to. that's where it was going to be, but... <laughs> Should I, should I? Yeah, please. All right, I'll, I'll tell the story. Shane, it's funny. Shane Davis has gotten a lot of play on this podcast. When I had Rich Roney on last season, we told the story of how he stalked oh, Shane yeah. Davis in New Jersey, and it costed him at the laundry mat at the bagel yeah. store. At the deli, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he, Shane Davis returns in season two. So what was your Shane experience? Shane Davis does return. All right, so uh, I never met the guy. Um, I, I think he's, a, I think he's a, a, a good artist, definitely. You know, probably, you know, I would say great. He's, he's, he's pretty great. Yeah. Um, so I had commis- I had asked him. I went up to his line. I had said, "Hey, listen, can you draw um, Witchblade wearing the red lantern ring?" And he gave me the the craziest, bullshittiest excuse in the world. Um, he said, "I don't draw women," and I I, I was I, I was floored. I I didn't know like what to say. I mean, I was like, "What the fuck is the matter with you?" In my mind, but the words didn't seem to come out. But so I, I was like, you know, um, like e- even if you can do just like a head and like the fist showing the ring. And again, nothing like, you know, risque or pornographic or like, you know, um, you know, crude. Um, and I was just I was just stunned. I was like, why? It's like you're a comic book artist. Half the people you draw are female characters. Like, what the hell is the matter with you? Some sort of like, you know, religious is nut. But like, isn't, the isn't your rule no dudes? My rule is no dudes. Okay, definitely. so his rule is no chicks. Guess so, I guess so. Uh, no, so that, that's definitely know, the strangest touche. excuse I've ever heard in my entire life. Yeah, I, I, I was just floored. Have you found? Because I know a lot of uh, art collectors post their stuff online. Have you found anyone who's posted a Shane Davis piece of a woman? I have, I have no idea. I, I, I was so turned off by that experience. I was like, you know, fuck that guy. That's it. We should, we should find one. We can print it out. And you can go back and confront him at the next show. Yeah, well, what the hell is this? I, I thought you were going to say, like, you know, Nana and Poo Poo, you know, like, you know, look what he did, and you didn't get anything. No. No? <laughs> no. You're not going to rub it in my face? No. <laughs> okay. Well, speaking of your no dudes policy, this is jumping ahead a little bit, because I do want to get into, like... Like strange behaviors? Oh, well, no, but just, like, what's, what sort of stuff you gravitate to. But that is, I know that is a rule of yours. You, it is you a rule You will not of get art of, of men. What, I mean, what's the, the rationale behind that? Uh, I don't know. Like, it, it's not like a, a, a homophobic thing or anything like that, but it's just, you know... Um, I rather have female characters done, you know. But I, I mean, I, I have I have a spawn piece, I have a grifter piece, so there are a few exceptions here and there. But I definitely ask for like you know female characters, and a lot of the artists that I like, that's what they're draw, known for. They're, that's what they're yeah. known for, you know. They they draw female centric, you know, books. Yeah. Well, maybe one day we'll get to the bottom of the the Shane Davis well, thing. Well, mo- most of well, again, it has to do with what your 
the comic books are that you like. Yeah, that's true. Ninety nine percent of the characters that I like or the stories I like, it's it's all male superheroes. It's all dudes and spandex. Yeah, so primarily that's what my collection consists of. Unless of course there's a you know female characters involved in whatever that storyline is. But uh, yeah, it's just what, like for instance, super popular artists that are known for drawing pinup characters like Adam Hughes. I couldn't care less about getting a piece from him, particularly because his guys look like chicks also. <laughs> but, like, I just don't have a care. And a lot of collectors just want to get something from him to say I've got an Adam Hughes piece. I couldn't care less about getting something simply because he's never drawn anything that I care about. Well, you do have an Adam Hughes piece. Do you? Oh, that little Thanos <laughs> yeah. sketch that a, a friend of ours got for yeah. me. It's a little – it's a Thanos sketch, which is neat. I like No, that I do like. But I would never commission him right. – to do Thanos because I don't trust that it would look like a version of Thanos that I like. Mm-hmm. No, you that know? Means- so. And again, that that's going back to doing your homework. You know, can the artist handle your request? Yeah. Well, jumping back to sort of the procedural aspect of this. So Tom talked about how you can go about getting a, a commission. Phil, you know, you bought a lot of original pages. Would you mm-hmm. say that's primarily what you focus on versus yeah, commissions? Pretty much. Uh, so, again, if someone's listening to this, they want to get an original page from a book. What? How do they go about that? You know, I'll be honest with you. Um, I'm going to drop a name. Uh, ComicArtFans.com. It's a website where basically a lot of collectors get together and they post their original. It's like art. a Facebook of exactly. you know comic collectors. Exactly. So you know, just search your favorite artist. Um, see what you know all the collectors that they have. I will be honest with you about 99. I don't I've never had a bad experience but most collectors are just super nice people. You know, they're enthusiastic, they're ecstatic. They love to see your collection, they want to show you theirs. You know, there's a subtle hint of bragging rights, etc. Totally. We totally. all, we it's all like, have it's it. It's like, look what I got. You oh, yeah. try, look what I got. You try to play modestly about it, but, you know, um, it's a great place to go check out their art. Um, I'd say majority of the artists that I'm aware of have an agent. So you can always try to, you know, Google their name uh, and with the word original art, you can try to find something. And, you know, take it from there. Try not to have an expensive hobby to begin with. You start small. I mean, that's just the best way to do it. And that's why you should always go to conventions. You know, you can see what you like. And um, I know you already had a question on this. I think it also helps is don't go in there thinking you're going to make money. Buy what you like, not because what you think people will like. Well, yeah, that was one of my questions for you guys is, you know, t- to what extent are you buying these things just out of pure enjoyment and, and as a fan versus, you know, buying it as a potential investment? I mean, for me personally, um, I bought, started out buying what I like and somehow I've been fortunate enough that people always ping me on the inbox of comic art fans or whatever and say, hey, are you interested in selling? So I've been fortunate <laughs> enough that things that I like, people like as well, but it's never been my intention to sell. If I need money, I will do it. That's the good thing about original art. Um, you not you might not always get all your money back, but you can always find a seller, a buyer for your art. But um, for me, it's always been, you know, love of what you like. You buy what you like at the end of the day. Don't think of, hey, there's a Doctor Strange movie coming out. I'm going to try to buy as much art as I can that has to do with it. Don't do it that way. Just enjoy it because it reminds you of your childhood. You know, you can never buy your childhood. So, you know, you can never put a price on it, sorry. So that's why, you know, a lot of us buy things that remind us of our childhood. So that's what I would recommend is buy what you love. Never, don't go in as a speculator because in the 90s, you saw what happened with all that stuff, with comic books. Right. So. So, and then I know there is a range, just as with the with the commissions, there's a range with the original art as well, whether mm-hmm. you're buying, you know, a, a regular page versus a splash page versus a double page spread, right. and what the character is and who the artist is. I know there's a huge range in that, but I mean, uh, are there any sort of averages or, or ranges or, or ballparks that you can give us as far as uh, how much this stuff costs? Um, I mean, if you look at, um, well, for example, I think the funniest thing is if you look at astronomical prices, uh, this is reflects none of us who can buy it but uh you know the green arrow green lantern 76 i believe that's the uh, the neil adams book i think the original sold for about four hundred and forty thousand dollars. the actual cover um but in terms of you know just a small time collectors like i'm i consider myself a small time collector as well um you know it depends covers can go from four to six thousand um splashes 2500 double pages probably three grand or so um but yeah, for the most part, those are the cover ranges that I've seen personally. I'm not a big collector of covers. I mean, I have one or two, but you know, I try to collect interiors because a it's affordable, and you know, it's something that I enjoy. Like I like the story aspect of it. You can tell a you can tell a story by just looking at a piece of art. You know, so how much does it cost? How much did I mean? If you don't mind me asking, how much was that entire issue that you bought? Uh, thirty two hundred. 
which That's is actually not bad. Not bad. I no. would have expected a lot more. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah definitely. P- p- the pages range all over the place. Uh, you can go to shows, and, and again, comic books aren't just superheroes. You know, like uh, again, Ron Lim, whom Tom and I are very good friends with, has tons and tons and tons of Sonic the Hedgehog pages. They did for Archie. And realistically speaking, you'd be lucky if someone wanted to buy them. And if you put them out to sell, maybe you'd charge $25 a piece just because someone thinks it's neat. Most expensive page to ever sell, last page to Hulk 180, uh, first appearance of Wolverine, uh, at Heritage Auctions with the buyer's premium, which is what a buyer pays Heritage for the privilege of winning the bid and buying the piece, $657,250 that page went for now that's an extreme situation um but it's not uncommon to see silver age pages kirby fantastic four uh ditko spider-man to go 20 30 40 thousand dollars routinely uh, at heritage auction comic link comic connect a lot of these uh auction sites that deal in a lot of original art that being said uh, when a lot of people say oh, I can't collect original artwork because it's too expensive, you can collect artwork just as inexpensively, for lack of a better term, as comic books or toys or statues or anything else. Just a matter of what you get. You know, comic books, some people collect, you know what, I want to collect John Byrne's Superman run from the 1980s. Well, it's not going to cost you a whole lot to do it. You know, you want your Green Lantern and this and that. It's not going to cost you a lot. But when someone says, I want to collect Detective Comics number one and all the Golden Age Detective Batman and Superman, it's going to cost you a lot of money. So it's the same thing with artwork. If, if Generally, if there's new comic books coming out and you like the pages that are coming out, you can find the dealer or the artist that does it. Usually a couple hundred dollars to get you a page. Not that that's an insignificant amount of money, but, you know, you're not buying Picassos or Rembrandts. You don't have to think it's going to be in the hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to get stuff. You can collect it if you want to, but be careful with what you get. Decide how much you want to spend, and there's always something in your price range to get. I mean, if you're focusing on things like, hey, Watchmen was great, Batman the Killing Joke, you know, Dark Knight Returns, you know, obviously you're going to price yourself out. But, you know, that's like the big leagues where, you know, the good thing about those books is that they were all limited runs. So that definitely made a very big driving point for prices being high as they are. And uh, same thing with the Ditko stuff, the early Spider-Man. Good luck with that, by the way. Trust me, there's stories about those. But, I mean, I've seen the Killing Joke pages being traded left, being sold left and right, like playing cards. It's, in, it's absurd. It's the same pages. It's only 48 pages. But you see them just being turned around left and right, left and right. So, you know, it's very interesting that, you know, if you're going to focus on those, obviously you need to understand. But, you know, if you're an average Joe Schmo, you can contact any artist. I mean, they'll be fairly priced pieces you can get. So... Is it possible to negotiate with the artists? Are they often receptive to that or not Not so much? Depends. Depends. Personally, I've had a pretty good experience with some really high-level artists that, you know, they are able to negotiate. I mean, they're not going to give you a 40% discount, but, you know, they'll knock off a couple of hundred bucks if it's, you know, a thousand or so, you know. So they're, I think they've been very accommodating for me personally. Yeah, I mean, I've had good experiences uh, where in general, I'll, you know, I'll say, how much is this? How much is that? Okay, if I buy 10 or 15 pages from you, what can you do for me? And, you know, that's unusual. That's not something that artists typically get. You know, of course, they have dealers coming to them saying, give me everything you have. But I'm talking more of a retail price level. You know, what if I were to buy, you know, a, a number of pages from you? And they're always receptive to discounting and, and giving a good deal. And if they know that you're a repeat customer, if you become, I don't want to say if you become friends with them, but if you become someone that you'll see them at the cons, you say hello, they know you always want something, they're always willing to, to work with you and help you out. Because uh, Jim Calafiori, who I used to, to buy a number of uh, commissions from and get pages from, always used to sell his pieces and his work for what I consider to be a very low price. I said, why do you sell them so inexpensively? He said, I get paid to do this. I figure anything I get off of this is gravy. So I don't feel the need to charge up the yin-yang. Now, artwork has become increasingly popular since then. This was a number of years ago, and he's raised his prices, uh, you know, to sort of stay in line. But he's still inexpensive compared to a lot of other people. And I think it's sort of a good attitude to have to say, you know, I'm, 
I get paid to do my work. This is just a little bit extra on the side. And he realizes, and a lot of artists don't realize this, because a lot of artists say, I don't want to sell it too cheaply. You want to know what? If you get, you know, if it's a 22-page book and you're the pencil and you're getting 14 pages back and you price it outrageously and manage to sell two or three pages but the other 11 are sitting at home, what good does that do you? Aren't you better off getting something than nothing? Because honestly, all the new stuff, after the next title comes out or the next issue, no one cares about the other stuff. It's not like the stuff from the 80s. You know, in the 70s and the 60s, that's the old. nowadays stuff, it's like you better strike while the iron's hot or, or you may just be sitting on it forever because some other new crossover or super event's going to come out and they don't care about your stuff. You know, you mentioned that artist in particular raising his prices. And, and Phil, when we were talking about this uh, ahead of time, you mentioned skyrocketing prices with mm-hmm. this. So I was wondering if you could speak to that. And then I guess, you know, beyond that... You know, you guys uh, seem to have found a way to, to do it responsibly. I mean, Tom, you had your little issue at the convention that time. But, I mean, you guys, you know, you're not out on the street holding your art, you know. But we've definitely seen and heard, you know, some horror stories, you know, especially, you know, within some of the folks at Alternate Realities, you know, who maybe got a little bit too caught up in this. I mean, so I guess, <laughs> you know, how how do you keep from, from getting to that point? How do you do this in a way that is responsible when it, it is maybe tempting to, to kind of overextend yourself financially get a significant other in your in your life no um well that, it does you know, help. maybe you know it helps you stay grounded you know i've recently been married and you know you realize you know things become priority and you know for me guess what paying rent is a little bit more important than buying art you know you learn i'm speaking from a relationship perspective you learn that you become less selfish you know you you're in a relationship you have someone else to take care of and, you know, they can take care of themselves, obviously. But, you know, you have to understand, you know, some things get priorities as you mature, as you get older. So for me, prospectively, that's what was my moment where it's like, okay, you know, I still collect art. You know, I still get very good deals. I look for deals now. For example, um, if you're a semi-moderate collector, you have 10 to 15 pieces. I just learned that recently the concept of trading is a wonderful, wonderful concept. You don't always have to spend money. You can do trades. Um with that situation, you're actually putting a value on what you think you can get for a trade value. So I just learned this recently. As I mentioned, I traded in 25 pieces of artwork. I got cash, and I got three pieces of artwork. You know, two are from John Cassidy, who's a phenomenal artist, one from Ivan Rice. And for me, I can justify saying, okay, I'm not going into pocket. I had pieces. I, uh, You know, they ran their course in terms of me of appreciating them, but it's time to move on. And I can strongly encourage people to start looking and trading in terms of what you already have. I mean, you can't just, you know, if you're not willing to do that, you have a problem of hoarding, so we have another issue. But personally, I think trading is a wonderful outlet once you feel like money's tight. And you know what? Try to get rid of some pieces so you can buy new ones. Um, what about you, Tom? Have you parted with any of your stuff? Um, I've never parted with any of my stuff. It's definitely harder to sell and trade commissions because... Yeah. Who's going to want a Dave Finch Witchblade? Maybe one other person out there, you know, a handful. It, it's difficult to you know, to, you know, uh, <clears throat> to resell commissions or trade commissions. Original pages definitely I can see, you know, it being easier to, but my collection is pretty much 90% commissions. So it's difficult to um to um to to, to flip those over. Um but for me personally, I mean, in terms of like controlling the habit there's a point where you hit where it's like, all right, I'm, I, I don't need to buy, you know, at every show. I don't need to buy 15, pay, 15 pieces. I've done that. I've done 20 pieces at San Diego, and it, it was great. At New York Comic Con, I think I bought two, you know, and they were from Ken. Um, and for me, like, you know, it, it was from back when I was collecting, I needed to buy from all the superstar artists. If, if, if you were like, you know, um, you know, Kucha, I needed a piece from you. If I saw you, I was going to get you. Um, but now it's like I've chosen artists that I like. I'm friends. I'm friends with Ron. I'm friends with Ken. Um, I'll, I'll seek them out to get, to get a piece from. Um, but again, if, like, if, if, if like, you know, um, uh, Jim Lee's at a show, I'm not going to wait on his line for hours to get like a doodle from him. To me, it's not worth it anymore. I, I have so much better stuff that I can get from my friends. And it's just a better experience. And again, like, you know, as time goes on, um, you, you kind of hit a wall. It's like, all right, I've been collecting. I have a lot of stuff. I have, I have 
12 different which blades i have 12 different spider-mans or whatever you kind of just hit a wall and you get like you don't get tired of it but it's not it's not a priority anymore for you I agree. Like a lot of times you have that enthusiasm. You want to get that one superstar artist and year after you keep trying and trying. And then after a while, you're just like, it's just not worth it. Or, or who was that for you? Uh, well, personally, I mean, I would say maybe Adam Hughes. I want to, but um, he's actually, he had some issues where he had people flipping things. He used to be very cheap in terms of his commissions. They were maybe 300 or so. Less. Le- even less, but yeah. then people just started flipping them, and he realized, you know, I try to do this as a favor to my fans, but you have these greedy individuals that make into a business, so he just makes his prices go a couple of thousand. So you know, it's like if you really want it, you will do it. I, I mean, I have a very funny story. I have an f- artist friend. You know, when he goes to shows, believe it or not, he does not like doing commissions, but he's like, you know, people always pester him, so he decides, you know what, I'm just going to throw an absurd number. So for a basically a printed page size, thousand dollars. He had 10 people on his list within half an hour. And he's like, oh, it did not work. There's maniacs out there. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, you know, some people are just so driven. They're so passionate about it, artists or whatever, that even if the artist tries to create deterrence, you know, people still want it and they will go through it. And yeah. Do you guys see a lot of the same people at, at these shows, like going up to the same artists that you are and stuff like that? Yeah. And you become friends Definitely. with them because <laughs> yeah. it's like a competition. You're like, hey, yeah, yeah, you doing? Oh, did you get? No. OK, what did you get? Oh, that's nice. But. Definitely have had that feeling. Yeah, no, I definitely have art friends, as it were. Even just via that site, Comic Art Fans, that Phil mentioned, just a number of different people in there. I've never met them. I don't even know where any of them live. Uh, But, you know, whenever something, we have same interests, you know, Marvel Cosmic or Ron Lim or whatever it is. And whenever something pops up that the other guy owns, hey, what's going on? Great. You know, this and that. It looks good. Uh, You definitely become uh, friendly with people. And actually that, I think, takes over the drive to get a commission or get artwork. Because nowadays with the internet, a show is not a requirement for getting any of this. You can contact people online. Most original artwork that's available for sale can be found online. It's rare that you'll go to a show and see something that you haven't seen yet, uh, unless for some reason a dealer just kept it and said the first time people are going to see it is at the show and honestly a lot of people on a Wednesday look at a new comic book and as soon as they see something they like they contact the artist or they contact the rep piece may be sold before it's even on the market as it were Mm -hmm. that happens Uh, a lot which yeah which definitely happens happened with your uh, your Dale Keown Thanos cover yeah exactly because I don't even think the issue was out yet but they showed a preview of it and you went and bought it and now you have it so thank uh, you Drew you're welcome (laughs) So uh, yeah, so so it's it's interesting that uh, you definitely become friendly with people, and they'll actually help you out. You you don't become a competitor anymore, but they'll be like, hey, I saw a piece that I thought you might like. Do you want it? And they actually help you find stuff. So it's you know it it, it becomes sort of a camaraderie with these people, also, which is an interesting aspect to doing stuff. You know, or, or if you want to get rid of something, you say, you know what? Instead of trying to get top dollar on an auction or something, let me contact this guy. Maybe he wants it. And you do each other favors. You know, I've gotten stuff relatively inexpensively that way, or traded stuff, as Phil pointed out, because they have something they want to get rid of. I have something I'm willing to get rid of. It's nice and easy, and it's great. Yeah, well, we spent the season talking about the community that developed at a comic shop, but that sense of community clearly permeates other aspects of, of this hobby and this industry. Um, you know, building on that idea of, of you know cultivating friendships, not just with fellow art collectors, but with the artists themselves. I mean, uh, Drew and Tom, both of you have already hit on this uh, as well. But I mean, you guys have truly become friends with a lot of the artists who you were initially, you know, customers of, basically. So I mean, how does how does that evolve? <laughs> how do you, how do you get to that point where you know you're hanging out and and you know sitting with them at their table? Well, the fellow that I'm honestly just good friends with is Ron Lim. He was, he was at, at my, your wedding. He was at my wedding, as you all know. He brought the, his wife and son out. So that was great. And uh, it was basically my first San Diego Comic Con 2003 looking through the uh, you know, the guidebook to the show. I said, oh, Ron Lim is here. So that's great. I haven't you know read a book of his in 10 years, but I, I like to go see him this and that. And I'm very uh aware of the fact that a lot of the you know there's the crazy comic book fans and these guys get you know who knows what sort of loonies they get trying oh we should hang out we should go out to get dinner this and that i brandon and his uh story with uh, uh who was it was it bernie wrightson 
I can't remember. There's a there's a funny story with that, which I'll tell you off air from the, from the comic shop. Um, but yeah, I went up to him then in 2003 and said, "Hey, I'd like to, uh, you know, get some commissions from you." And I must have gotten like five or six commissions, bought like six or seven pages from him. I re- got a lot of stuff, and I said, "Hey, do you, you know, there's a page I'm looking for. Do you think you have it?" Oh yeah, you know, here's my email. You know, ask me about it. And I said, "What about commissions at home?" Yeah, great. So I got a few other things. And I went to San Diego for about four or five years in a row. The next year I saw him, hey, how are you? I'm Drew. We met last hey, how are you? The next year, 2005, and we had chatted more often, he's actually the one that said to me, hey, we should go out and get dinner sometime. I said, hey, great. I said, no, I'd, I'd love to. It'd be really good. He said, I was always, I said, I didn't want to ask you because I'm sure you get, you know, you get the crazy fans all the time. No, no, you seem like a good guy, this and that. And we just, became friends maybe the next year is when tom came to san diego so tom met ron and this and that and then uh, other friends of ours kevin out there he met ron so we just became good friends i think part of it is just because he's a nice guy and and he gets along with everybody uh and and he and i hit it off and then obviously hit it off with tom and our friend kevin um but basically i just didn't look for it i just said this is a guy that when i see him at a show i'll say hi if i can email him once in a while to say hello and ask for a commission, great. Uh, so if the artist says to you, hey, let's go grab dinner, then at least you know, okay, he realizes say that yes. I'm not a complete mm-hmm. psycho. Yeah. You know, which it would have been good. great if you had been like, no, I'd rather just keep this professional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't know about but how are you going to do my commission tonight if we're after dinner. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's such a fanboy moment, too, when like they make the communication with you about this, and you're like, oh, my God. like You act like a child. It's, it's a great – I mean, I can tell you from my personal experience, too, when they become very you know friends <laughs> with you – and they take the initiative. It's like the greatest feeling you're like. I mean, who have you had that with? Um, it was probably with uh, Jerome Opeña and Olivia Coppel. I was like, oh, we're going to go to a steakhouse. You want to come? And I'm like, huh? That's the greatest thing ever. I'm sitting with them. But personally, I think, I don't know if I can speak with the rest of the guys, but for me personally, when I've become friends with these guys, it's not because of the comics, but it's basically just small talk. Mm-hmm. Just talking about life in general. That's how I became friends with a lot of people is because we had common interests that were not comic book related. Because I personally felt like, you know, everyone just keeps talking. About, oh, I love your work on X Force. I love your work. It's like you know they might get tired of it, so let's talk. And then I found out coincidentally that we have common interests. We like the same radio shows. We like the same music. We like instruments and things like that. So I've been able to honestly say I've cultivated my friendship with a lot of artists because we have common interests that ironically are outside of comics. And you know that's how they feel more comfortable is because you know you're not a fanboy stalking them. You're a, a guy that hey, he's just like me. He's like a, a cool guy. So. Personally, that's how it worked out for me, personally. Yeah. And what about Tom, you and, and well, Ken Marion, you very yeah, recently. Ken was here. Yeah, so yeah. we're recording once again here at the Spider's Web in Yonkers. Uh, thanks to Paul, as always, uh, for having us. But yeah, fairly recently, you set up a signing uh, for Ken to come here to the Spider's Web, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it, was, it, was a great, it was a great day. You know, you guys should have been there. I feel you were there. I was there. Which is good. You yeah. guys. I'm you not know. in the gunny sack. I'm good. <laughs> You're good. You're good. Was it, I think it was a holiday. I yeah, couldn't make right. it. Wasn't it Passover or something? Uh, you could have come for an hour or so. I don't know. I was trapped. I had an engagement yeah. party. I would have come if I could have. You very for my birthday. You very nicely gave me uh, one of his his prints, uh, which is really cool. It was I a nice it. one. Yeah, it was. That's I a got carrier. a Thanos sketch. Yeah. Oh, you did. Yeah, nice. You I didn't know that. that. And you see, uh, Paul has the Spider Man sketch that he did. For oh, him so a, you got an you got an original you got a sketch. Yeah, I got, yeah, yeah, original I got a, piece. I got a reprint. That's all right. Oh, you don't collect original art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. There I w- I will interject here and say that one of the worst things you can do if you like an artist's artwork and like getting commissions from them be their friend is be their friend mm. oh my god yeah, it's, I was gonna ask it's yeah. impossible to, because oh I can do it for you anytime oh yeah sure whatever you want yeah that's great you, you, you never get it forget it I haven't gotten a commission from Ron in like a decade <laughs> That's no, I mean, true. Not, it's not quite that bad, but it's literally the, almost the worst thing you can do. Is, is it, Once you become friends with them, it, you have first dibs on original artwork they do for comics. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's true. But commissions, forget it, you're out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, Tom, so for you, with you and Ken or any of the other guys that you've become friends with, has it happened in a similar way? Um, yeah, actually. Um, recently on the rise, like, you know, pre-show commissions have become popular and at-home commissions. So... Um, it was it was probably in the spring where no were no real conventions that Ken was going to and he was home and I, I commissioned I, I, on Facebook I was like you know because um, I've been about the show previously so we we're friends on Facebook and um, uh, I, I guess we were like more like casual acquaintances 
But I, 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 you know, sent him a message on Facebook. And I was like, hey, listen, you know, what do you think about doing a commission for me? You know, um, and he was like, you know, sure, I'll, I can get it done like right now. So it was like a week and a half turnaround time. And he was like, I'm in Brooklyn. Um, and I was like, Let, let's, let's meet up at Midtown and, you know, we'll exchange and then we'll be on our way. It ended up being six hours. Hmm. We hung out. We were at the, at the comic shop. We were just talking. And as Phil said, like, we just didn't really talk about comics that much. We're talking about, like, you know, music, we're talking about, like, girls and whatever, that kind of stuff. And there was a lot of stuff that wasn't about comic. But, I mean, definitely, like, you know, there was a lot of talk about, like, you know, 90s comics. But, like, it was more like, more like the business, not like, you mm. know, like, oh, I like Wildcats. Sure, everyone does. Um, but, like, since then, you know, we've been we've been friends. And, you know, we exchanged numbers. Um, we would hang out in the city once in a while. Not, not for, like, you know, comic book stuff, but just as, as friends. And at shows, he'll say, hey, I'm going to a show. You're going to be there. And I'm like, and I was like, you know, if I can make it, I'll go down. I'll sit at his table, work his booth. And then afterwards, you know, we'll just hang out. Well, that's really cool. Well, for yeah. listeners out there who are hoping to uh, accomplish the same, you know, be cool. Act mm-hmm. like you've been there before. Don't Very. be a fanboy. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Like, you know, that's, let it that's, happen organically. We, we've totally like, you know, knocked on people for being like total like, you know, weirdos. So yeah. just just keep it cool. We're, we're just the lucky weirdos. Yes, that's true. We're still fanboys at heart, but you know we can keep our composure and not you have to keep not composure. go off the off the deep end. But I still remember the the story with uh, Jerome and Pena when you guys were quoting the what's that movie, The Dragon? Well, Last Dragon. Last Dragon. I'm yeah. just sitting there, and these two are just jumping quotes left and right. I'm like, what is happening right now? But it was just hilarious because you know, once again, completely non comic related. It's very pop culture, of course, but just the fact that these were just, they were just exchanging, like finishing the dialogues for one another. I'm like, this is. Hilarious. I don't know what's happening. But. Good stuff. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, and, you know, much like we talked about with the friendships that we developed at, at the comic shop, I mean, you know, yeah, our shared love of comics is what initially brought us to the store and was probably the first thing that we talked about. But, you know, uh, the friendships obviously go much deeper than that. So in a similar way, it's like, yeah, if you were only ever just talking about their art, mm-hmm. you know, it would probably get old fast. Yeah, but, totally. yeah, when you have those other things in common and all of that. So, Tom, you mentioned how you've kind of become like Ken's unofficial rep. Have you or any of, or Phil or, or Drew, um, thought about actually being like an actual official rep for anybody? Is that something you would have any interest in or, or not really? I'm actually good friends with most reps, so <laughs> I don't need to kind of jump into that end. I've seen the stress <laughs> they take. It is a very, very stressful job. I mean, I work the tables and I'm I'm doing the smaller stuff versus the the big guy, you know. So, I mean, I do handle money. I do things like that. I keep records. I guess that's just my business background. That's why he loves me being there. He's like, oh, you, can, you know where the money is, who goes to where. That's right. Phil's, for those who uh, heard Phil last season, he's our oil, our resident oil baron. Uh, just uh, Oil's at $40. He's so modest, it's, this guy. Oil's at $40. I can't really If you burn. need money, Phil's got it. <laughs> oh, come on. You guys are too nice. But... <laughs> It's it's a lot of responsibility. I mean, if you want it, I mean, I love working the tables, but at least I know it's only for four days or so out of an <laughs> entire year. But you know, it's a, it's a very it's a full time job almost. It's yeah, of course, because you know you have to ship artwork on time. You have to make sure you get it insured. You have to make sure it's coming your way. Um, you know, you have to keep a reputation. It's all a reputation based business. I mean, if you have a full time job, you know, some people can pull it off. Um, you know, um, I could think of Jim Lee's rep as a guy who has a full time job working for the city, and is also Jim Lee's rep. So, you know, some people can do it well, but personally, you know, I kind of enjoy the fact that I'm just a little bit behind the scenes, not too much. So for me, I mean, I've, I love to help out my friends, but not as a full-time job because it is a full-time job. You can't do it casually. Yeah, I think there are a number of reps, though, as you just mentioned, Jim Lee's rep, uh, that do it part-time. It isn't actually a full-time job because mm-hmm. – in the grand scheme of things, I don't know how much money there is. I think a lot of reps become reps because it sort of gets them right. an the inside track inside, on certain yeah. things and access, and that just because they're fans of it and they do it. Uh, I've helped Ron out on a number of occasions doing stuff, uh, mainly for commissions when I was uh, online on statueforum.com, and Ron said, do you think anybody wants a commission? And, of course, I went online and said, anybody want a commission? And there was just... Dozens and dozens and dozens of people that wanted something, wanted pages, wanted commissions. Uh, you know, the the money factor becomes an issue. How do you make sure that, you know, the money is going towards a piece being done in a timely manner and that this and that? And basically what I did is I spoke with Ron and said, Ron, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to collect the money. And as soon as you finish the piece and send it out, I will then give you the money. But if you haven't started the piece yet and the person wants the money back... I'm going to give it back to them. And Ron said, that's fine. I don't want to have to think about the money. I just want to draw. 
and it worked out well because Ron did them in a timely manner and started punching them out, and people were very happy this and that. And I think that was a, a good experience for me, but I think it's a rare experience. That's the problem. I think a lot of art reps, they have to juggle dealing with the artist also. I mean, the artist is their client when it comes down to it. And there's that fine line between you don't want to lose your client, but you can't afford to allow your client to ruin your reputation as an art dealer. So it's a fine line how you do it. And I also distinguish between two different types of art dealers. There are those who represent current artists who are constantly getting an influx of new artwork on a monthly basis or whatever. And then there are a number of art dealers who don't rep anybody that is deal in older artwork. Um, that's probably an easier way to go simply because you just own everything that you have and you're dealing it, but you're not constantly getting new product either. So your inventory can become very stale, which is why you'll see, as Phil pointed out, certain pages didn't trade it, trade it, trade it, trade it, trade it because a dealer can't move it. But some other dealer says, well, I'll take it. What do you want for it? And then they trade pieces. Uh, but that being said, I would never want to be an, an art rep for anybody except helping a friend of some sort sell stuff. That would be fine. Okay. Otherwise, not worth the effort. You'll find that there's a sometimes there's a disconnect between what an, what you as a fan think something is worth and what the artist thinks it's worth, primarily because an artist, again, doing it as a business, looks at the time and effort put into the piece as part of the calculation, whereas a collector doesn't care. So you'll see a two-page splash of a cityscape, really detailed city, and, and the sky is done nicely, and you see the cars in it, but there's really no characters on it. Nothing distinguishing it. You don't even know what book it is except for what's written up top, and they want a seemingly astronomical amount of money for it because this took me three days to do. Whereas you'll look at it and be like, yeah, but there's nothing here. Well, why do I want this? It doesn't mean anything to me. Whereas sometimes you'll see another piece that they did really quickly, but you're like, and the artwork maybe isn't that great, but it, you'll look at it and say, well, this is where this happened. And even though the word balloons aren't on it anymore, and I don't know what it, you know, someone looking at it doesn't know what's going on. You say, this was the pivotal point in the story where this was, I got to have this. And meanwhile, they're charging 50 bucks for it because they, they just think it's some crappy panel page and they don't care. Right. So, yeah. so always be aware that just because you think it's great and just because you're looking for it, doesn't necessarily mean that anybody else is or that the artist thinks it has any value. So don't think that this is so great. How much is this going to cost you? You may be surprised. That's true. I have a Michael Turner piece. It is the most random page you could ever think of. It's from Wolverine Witchblade. It only has um, Witchblade's face cut off, like three quarters. But as a kid, I always loved that image. And I bought it directly from Frank, who was um, the president of Aspen. He says, I don't have many Turner pages, but I have this one. He just flipped to it. And that was my favorite image. I don't, you know, just something from childhood. I'm like, I love it. He goes, oh, okay, I will sell it to you for, it was very reasonably priced. I'm like, you know what, done, call it a day. So that's the thing, it's just whatever emotion it invokes in a collector, that's what matters. I was there for that purchase. Yeah, I know, I was very, I was right there. I was so happy. I'm like, <gasps> this is, I literally became a child and said, this is my childhood. I outright said that statement. I'm like, this is my childhood. I'm like, I want it. I was like, really? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, really? You like that page? All but right. Those are the best pieces in a collection. Exactly. And that's what, you know, yeah. I have a number of pages that people said, do you want to sell it? And I'll say it's not worth it for me to sell it because it's not worth enough financially to justify letting go of it because I like it too much. So unless you want to pay some astronomical sum, and even then I said, forget it. I'd rather just keep it. I paid practically nothing for it. It's not worth moving it. And and those are the best pages to have. I could put an entire portfolio together of those pages that people will be like, huh? And I'll be like, yeah, but that's, this is when this happens. They're like, mm, okay, I don't care. I buy it for me, not for you. So th there's always something to get, and you'll find stuff you like, and it won't cost you a lot. This is shifting just a little bit, but I, I'm curious. Um, now that artists have the capability to draw on, on a device, a tablet, for example, have you seen any decrease in the number of original pages available for newer books? Um, I've seen the um, vacancy for inkers now, that there's no inkers anymore. Mm -hmm. um, a good. lot of artists shoot, a lot of, a lot of artists will do tight pencils, and they'll be scanned to a colorist, which will be colored over which can turn out okay or pretty shitty. But they're still Definitely. starting out on paper, you're saying? Some do, some do. I mean, um, I know I was speaking to Ron that when he draws the, the children's books, he draws on the tablet. Uh, so there's no original art 
physically. It's no tangible copy. Right. So whatever program he uses gets sent over to, I guess, a colorist. Um, but, you know, I, I think that a lot of artists are using digital, you know, tools to, you know, to do their artwork. And obviously, you know, if you hit print 20 times, it's not really an original art page anymore. It loses its, its cachet. But the funny thing is that these same artists, their previous hand-drawn uh, pages that are actually printed go, are astronomical. Brian Boland, clear example. He's gone completely digital. He's been digital since, I guess, the early 2000s. So anything that he draws by hand now, which is basically the Camelot stuff, the, you know, the killing joke, etc., is just astronomical prices. Um, you know, it's a means of income that artists are, you know, foregoing. But if it terms of, you know, it's a job for them, so they don't even look at it that way. Yeah, I guess if it makes the the main job that much easier, yeah. Yeah. then it can be worth it. Well, that's just it. They can typically produce more, or if there's a correction to make, you know, if they're halfway through a page, they don't have to start over again if they make a mistake, you know, per their vision of what it should look like. They can just hit back, 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 and get back to a certain point where they can do it again. And that, I, I understand why they do it as a collector. I don't like it. I remember a number of years ago at Heroes Con... Um, and Tom, I don't know if you were the one that was with the me. The Colossus pa- piece? Uh, not auction? that, Mark Brooks. Oh, oh yeah, the, the, that's a great the, story. The Thor cover. You got you to tell that story. That's the, a great story. It was basically... This is not, view my, this is not my views, this is Drew's. Yeah, Mark, no, no, Mark, Mark Brooks is a fantastically nice guy. I, I, I think he's very nice. I actually met him at San Diego years and years ago. We shared a cab to the uh, airport. It's like, hey, who are you at? Mark Brooks. Did you draw comics? Yeah, I should have become friends with him. But uh, it was just interesting that... It was Heroes Con, and his wife, I, I think it's his wife, yeah. uh, had stuff there, and they had a Thor cover available. It was like a, a, like a, a like, quadfold or something, right? Yeah, it was, it was like, like, four it was like covers. Yeah, two or three or four pages. And I said, oh, this is neat. You know, Can I take a look at it? Sure. And she takes it out of the portfolio and hands it to me to look at it. I say, how much is it? And I think she said something like ten or $11,000. Yeah, it was crazy. But she just handed it to me. I said, well, I said, this is pencils and inks. And she goes, no, no, he does everything digitally, and then he printed out and inked it. I said, okay, so there's there's no original art then. She said, well, no, this is the original art. I said, no, it's not. I said, because I could print that out and try inking it a thousand times, and eventually I will produce this. So, you know, this is crazy. Why on earth, you know, how do you justify charging this much money? And a lot of people differentiate well, this is the published piece. They don't necessarily call it original art anymore. Hmm. See, these are the published inks because that is the piece that the comic book page was produced off of. And I refuse to buy them. Yeah, I like pencils and inks best. If I need to go with just pencils, I will. But even typically, if something is only available in pencils, I won't buy it. I like the pencils and the inks. And that's something that collectors need to be weary of. That if you're buying... An inked piece, it's a it's original art, quote unquote, it's a cover, it's pages. Confirm that it's actually the original pencils and inked, not an inked blue line. Some people don't care. Some people say it's great, I'd like to get the pencils and the inks. Some people say, I just want the published piece, I don't care about the pencils. And everyone argues what's what. Nothing happens until the penciler does the pencils. The inks follow. So as far as I'm concerned, the pencils are the original artwork. Everything else, like I said, if they're printing on a blue line, they could try it 30, 40 times before they find one they like. You know, big deal. The pencils are the original. You got you got bamboozled at, at a Heroes Con auction. Yes. And that was a great story. Hey, Dominic. Oh, yeah. Well, before you, I yeah. just want to, because that was actually one of the things that I wanted to hit on. I know that there is that big, what's what's the deal with that auction at, at Heroes Con? It's, it's basically uh, Sheldon, who runs the show, uh, has uh, Heroes Aren't Hard to Find is the comic shop he has down in Charlotte. He has Heroes Con every year at the Charlotte Convention Center. And it's a very artist-centric show. A number of the larger shows, San Diego, uh, not so much New York, but a lot of other shows are becoming big business and giving away tables to artists does not generate revenue except for the artists. So a lot of artists are getting squeezed out and more vendors are coming in, stuff like that. You know, movies. You go to San Diego. Hollywood. Yeah, San Diego is really not a comic book. It should, it's not Comic Con. It should be like Pop Culture Con now because it's just everything and anything. It, it, it's hardly comic books itself anymore. But the show in in Charlotte 
has a huge art auction and a number of the artists uh, loving the show and the promoters and the venue and the town are more than happy to produce pieces or donate pieces for sale and not little cheapy, oh, this is something that I'm never going to sell, so I'll give it to you. They put time and effort into it. Mark Brooks and Adam Hughes, and I'm sure they still do it, have always said we're never going to produce a do a commission at the same time. At the same time, because we don't want to compete with each other. We want each piece to get as much as it can. It's become sort of tradition. What's the highest selling piece this year? Mm-hmm. Has a new record been broken? And, and their commissions have gone for well over ten thousand dollars at these shows, which I've seen one for thirty. Thir- really? One of the heroes? Okay, so it, so they've gone that high. And and this is purely people like contributing and helping Sheldon out and getting the show going. Um, but it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's, there's, it's the biggest art auction that I've seen at any of the shows. There can be hundreds of pieces. It goes on for hours. Uh, it's like a silent the, auction. It's like, it's like the actual auction. Yeah, yeah exactly. Know? It's like people sitting there bidding and this and that. People, ooh, yeah. ah, he, as, as the prices get up. Uh, just generally speaking, though, uh, not that this is what the show is about, Heroes Con is a fantastic show. I recommend that anybody that likes comic book shows go to it. Nice and laid back. Downtown Charlotte's a nice area. Lots of good artists. They're always happy there and everything. It's, but it's a lot of fun. It's it's the, uh, but the New York Comic Con art auction for St. Jude's uh, that my friend Mike Nagan runs. Fantastic guy. He runs Artist Alley. Great guy. Knows everybody. No one will ever say a bad word about him because there's no reason to. New York Comic Con art auction is fantastic. Uh, he does the same thing at C2E2 in Chicago. Emerald City Comic Con is oh. now. A read show, uh, great, but but Mike is. I don't know if he's ever been to Charlotte, but Mike is trying to make art auctions big again because he loves the art and he wants you know the artists is why we're there. They're the well and the writers obviously. It's the creators that made these conventions possible. That's why the conventions are there because you can get comic books anywhere now. You can get them online. You can buy them, but going to a show and seeing the artist that's the only place you're going to do it. So you want to help promote that and keep it a, a healthy industry, and, th- and these art auctions are a great way to do it. There. And you make new friends. I mean, I got into a bidding war with some guy. You know, the the whole ooh ah thing. You have your paddle up. He's has your paddle up. Who's going to put the paddle down first? And you know, I I won a bid for a, it was for Saint Jude's. It was a great cause. So for me, it didn't even matter that I was actually buying art. You know, you're doing something for a good cause. And I met the guy afterwards. He was a guy from Scotland. He goes, "Oh hey, so you be- you beat me for the thing?" I'm like, "Yeah, sorry about that." He goes, "I came all the way from Scotland to get this." I'm like. Oh, sorry. Which piece was that? Uh, it was the Lee Weeks um, Batman. Oh, Batman. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the next day, <laughs> I went to the artist. I'm like, hey, look what I got. And when I flipped it, I didn't realize the guy was standing right next to me. And I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> didn't mean to. And then after that, we've been just very good friends. We, you know, every time we see each other, hey, how you doing? It's the guy that beat me on the auction. But, um, you know, it's you're doing it for a good cause. Co- for the auction that I've been to, it's been for a good cause. And, you know, you can actually get some very wonderful deals. Sometimes you feel bad that, you know, you got it for such a low price because it's going for a good cause. But, I mean, I definitely, I mean, it's a very fun experience. Right. But so how did you get bamboozled? Uh, basically, this was back when I was uh, collecting, Col- actually, I wasn't even really collecting Colossus stuff, but early in my art collecting career, I always it was Colossus sketches and commissions that I was getting. And this was a piece that was by an artist named Dominic Stanton, who I'd never heard of, but I liked the way the piece looked. And it was advertised as a uh, pencil and ink, you know, commission by Dominic Stanton. This, and I thought it was really nice, and I paid like 150 bucks for it, 11 by 17. I said, "Oh, this is great. This is really cool. This and that." So at the end of the show, I went and picked it up, and I started looking at it closely, and I noticed there's blue line underneath. Now, this could be one of a, a few different things. It could either be a printout of pencils that come out as blue line, uh, and then are inked over. And for anybody that doesn't know, the reason that it's blue line is because when you photocopy it, the blue lines typically don't show up, at least on old school copiers they didn't. Nowadays, you can pick up the blue line easily on our color printers and color scanners, rather. And I looked at it, and I said, okay, well, maybe it's blue line pencil. And again, a lot of artists won't use traditional pencil to do something, but if they're going to ink their own work, they'll use blue line. So this way, once they're done, they don't really need to bother erasing anything because typically speaking, when you would scan it, you wouldn't pick up the blue line anyway. So I looked at it and said, wow, I really can't tell if this is legitimate pencil and inks or just inked over a blue line copy or something. So anyway, I I post this new artwork that I purchased on a statue forum. And 
no doubt someone says, hey, that's an inked version of my commission. And he posts his pencils that he got from Dominic Stanton. And I'm like, mother effer. I said, I can't believe that I paid 150 bucks, not only for an inked blue line, but it wasn't even something that he did on his own. This is something he got paid to do. And I, and it aggravated me to the point where I offered it to the guy. I said, I don't even want any money for it. Do you just want it? I don't want it. He said, no. So I ripped it up and put it in a shredder wow. and got rid of it. because and it was, Done. With, yeah, which goes back to Phil's point, which is when you get a sour experience from an artist, you don't want any artwork from them. You don't care. Even if it, you'd be amazed. It could be your favorite piece, and you look at it, and you're like, what an ass. And the artwork just, you know, bad. It's like a woman. And it's attitude. It consumes you. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, it's, you know, it's like the attitude of somebody. Attitude can make you either pretty or it can make you ugly as, as hell, you know? But you look at it, you're like, yeah. So there's a, f- a few pieces of artwork that have been, you know, I Terminated. parted with due to having a sour taste in my mouth with the artist. Fair enough. Ron, don't piss me off, man. Then I got a lot of stuff to sell. <laughs> yeah, that'd be bad. Oh, that'd be horrible. <laughs> my God. Um, but so, you know, you talked about how you would have no interest in something that was drawn digitally and printed out. And I mean, that makes total sense to me. I'm curious, do you, does, like, do uh, posters or prints or other reproductions like that hold any interest for you guys at this point or not really? Not anymore. No. Back early, it was cool. But, you know, again, it, it, it's a print out. Anyone can get it. You know, there, there there's no there's no connection, I guess. You know that it's yours or that it's one of a kind. So it, it loses its value in that way, I think, in my opinion. I mean, they do have you know limited edition prints that they do put out for certain shows that could be signed. So I mean, it does put a little value into it. I mean, personally, it never clicked for me, but I mean, there is a market for it. I remember Steve Ryan; he was looking very anxiously for a original theatrical release poster for, I believe, <coughs> Evil Dead. So you know. There is a market for some of the more vintage stuff. I mean, who wouldn't want an original Star Wars poster by Drew Strzan? You know, even though it's a poster, I don't care. It's still, you know, from the 70s or whatever. Personally, I mean, it's not for me, but, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a more affordable, viable option. So clearly, you know, I'm not biased towards it. And for children, you know, when you go to the shows, you know, parents will buy them for children. You know, $20 print instead of a $200 commission. Yeah, I, I've never gone out of my way to purchase you know, these $20, 11 by 17 prints that artists come out with, which is basically a way for them to make some money, this and that. Uh, More expensive lithographs, G-clays, you know, canvas G-clays, stuff like that, that I have some of because these are, you know, intended to be higher quality reproductions of artwork that, frankly, I would never be able to afford. Uh, Alex Ross stuff, there's an artist named Jerry Vanderstelt who does beautiful oil paintings for the Star Wars Celebration shows. He's done Lord of the Rings pieces. I mean, these are beautiful. The originals would be twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 and really aren't meant for the collect- you know, collectors end up buying them from him. But he then purposely makes 250 limited edition lithos that are $150, whatever, and they're numbered. Uh, again, the Warner Brothers store used to sell all of the Alex Ross G-Clays, the original seven, which is arguably the most popular g clay ever they've redone it like three or four times um you know i have a number of a few alex ross pieces that are marvel because i'm a marvel guy so that stuff i have but at this point wouldn't consider purchasing anymore because again the price of these g clays they can be anywhere between 800 and 1500 dollars i'd rather put my money into original artwork of of anything else than getting these but that being said i like these they're actually what are on my walls i don't have any original artwork on my walls because just being what i consider to be pragmatic and other people consider to be paranoid heaven forbid there's a fire or i got to get out of my place i want to be able to just grab my art everything else can be replaced except the artwork i don't care about the furniture i don't care about my clothes my passport can be replaced everything can be replaced so once the artwork goes it's gone the lithos can be replaced the g clays can be replaced everything can be replaced my wife i grab first yeah obviously <laughs> the artwork is second because that can't be replaced and that's actually why i like having it in portfolios i, I just want to be able to grab it if i need to it's also good because if i go to a show and people want to see something i, I don't know well sorry it's framed in a you know 30 pound frame at home so you know too bad i can actually just bring everything with me if i want to that's a perfect segue, actually, to our probably our last, you know, final topic here. You know, the question of, you know, do you display your art and how do you display it? And I mean, that that answers that. I mean, how do you guys uh, approach it? 
Um, personally, um, my everything's in portfolios. The Toya portfolios, which is I guess they have the market corner in regards to yeah. portfolios. Um, I personally love holding the artwork. So not even just flipping through the pages. I mean, I wash my hands thoroughly. I have a procedure, dry them to a T, and I literally take out pieces and I hold them in my hands. There's no better feeling. Uh, sometimes you can lightly put your hand across mm. it. I'm sure there's some better feelings. No better feeling in the art world. Thank you. Thank you. There you corrections, go. corrections, corrections. I appreciate it. But there's no better feeling in the art <coughs> community, in the art sense, that, you know, holding this piece of artwork. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I'm a huge Dale Keown fan, and when he inks his stuff, he uses, like, an engraving tool. I mean, you could feel just the indents in the pages. And, I mean, no matter how many times you put it in the portfolio, because the portfolio sleeves kind of puts a little yellow tint to it sometimes, just a dust. But when you take it out, you just see it in all its glory. So that's why I always like it. I mean, I do it maybe once a week or so. I take out all my portfolios. I take out each thing out, and I look at it because, you know, it's, you appreciate it better. You're looking at it right in front. You know, it doesn't have a shiny glass in front of it or anything like that. That's very interesting. You know, I, I expected that you guys would say that you have them in portfolios, A, because I've seen your portfolios, but B, <laughs> it's like even if you do want to put them on the wall, you guys have so many pieces, and there's only so much wall space that you have to work with. Um, but the fact that you actually have those reasons behind it is, is interesting to me. And, and the fact, that was one of the things I wanted to ask is, you know, if you're not displaying them, how often do you look at and enjoy them? And that's encouraging to hear that you do take the time on that regular a basis to do so. Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, because it reminds you of the good times, you know, when you were a child, the good times as a child, <laughs> correction. So, you know, like my pit number one is my favorite piece that I own. It's, um, and once again, it's the small little detail that I love about it is when, um, when the book was published, you could see within the character pit, he has a little bit of space right here, a white space. So there's black and then there's a little, and to me, it was just a very cool sense of depth into the character, the actual creation. And I just look at that, and to me, that's like the most amazing thing. It's very OCD-ish, but I mean, that's the one thing. So you you appreciate it when you take it out of the sleeve itself and look at it, and you're like, you know what, you appreciate it better. So. And Tom, you do keep you do portfolios too. Yeah, I do portfolios too. Um, I, I don't hang them up. I, I just feel that like when they're in frames, they can be like some of them. Some framers glue them to the backs. Oh, I didn't know that. And uh, I, I have I have lithographs that are like you know I'm gonna glue it the, the guy will say I'm gonna glue it to the back of the of the of the frame so essentially you've ruined your print so I I, I don't do that but um but but like Phil um, I like looking through it kind of like you know like oh you know I remember when I got that I remember when I got this I remember what I had to go through to get this um and like uh, I just to, to go off on a little bit of a tangent about my favorite piece. Um, it's a Tony Daniel um, piece from F5, which I'm sure nobody knows about, except but me. except for Tony, because Tony created it. And I had originally asked him to do um, a recreation of the cover, and it was the main character. Uh, holding, she was holding a gun, and she's uh, in the background. There's an American flag. So I had commissioned just a, a half body on like 11 by 14, so a smaller piece of paper. Um, and when I got it. It came in an 11 by 17, full body, fully inked, all colored, all is beautiful. It's my favorite piece. Um, and like when I look at it, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking like, you know, oh my God, like, you know, like this is what he did for me. And when I spoke to him, he was like, uh, he was so happy to have done it. And he was like, you know, I don't think anyone read the, read the book. Um, it's been so long since I've drawn this character before. And I was like, you know, we were just going on about how much like we, you know, we, we liked, you know, um, well, I was talking about how much I like this older stuff from from Image, and it just reminded me of, like a great time. And, and and the image itself, it's so simplistic, um, and there's really nothing that I guess anyone else could point out. It's like, oh, why do you like it so much? You know, it it's you know it's something that connects with me personally. That I I find like you know it, it reminds me of something that, like that really was 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 a good time. So. Yeah, I mean, that's very cool. Yeah, for me, like also with Pitt, I mean, you know, once again with the childhood stuff, I remember the first issue, issue number one, it was in the back issue bin because it came out in 93. I came to America around 94, 95. And, you know, it was, since it was in the secondary market, it wasn't $2 as the cover price, it was $4. So, you know, I had, to, you know, as a little kid, you try to find uh, any ways you can to scrounge up as much money as you can. And you finally get it, you have, you know, one or two single dollar bills, change, quarters, whatever. And you go to the cash register and you just, dump all this money just to get this one issue and you know when you get older you have a job you're stable and then all of a sudden you have ability to buy very comfortably an original piece which took you forever as a child to get the money for you know 
it's like a financial conquest that you know you finally made it in some aspect that you feel oh my god I can, I can afford something like this and I remember when I couldn't barely buy it you know but trying to find change under the couches so it has that much of a sentimental value too so that's why I kind of love that piece as well it's like you know and the fact that Dale's probably never going to draw a pit again that is also very true so I, I know Tony's not going to draw F5 anymore and you know it, it's it's just another piece of art that's out there now yeah because the book's never going to come back I'm sure no one else is going to commission this character, but like, you know, for the other fans that are out there that like this book, here's another image that you're never going to see that came out in 2015. Right. For, for any or all of you, is there, is there any thing out there, whether it's a particular piece or an artist that would be your ultimate get? but you don't foresee like it. Yeah, but you don't foresee it happening because either they're too expensive or reclusive or they're digital or whatever it may be. Like who would be the ultimate get for for any of you? Probably if I may say, uh the Brian Boland did uh Killing Joke. Actually my friend owns a piece. He's the rep for Brian Boland. It was against so small little detail. It's the scene where the Joker uh pulls the cowl in front of Batman's face and you just see the the fold in the clothing. I always loved that piece. And I went and met, met him for the first time. I'm like, oh, you're his rep. I'm like, do you own, you know this piece? And I just went like this. And he went at the same time. He t- I'm sorry. So auditory medium. He took the two fingers and he pulled it down because he didn't know, knew exactly what piece I was talking about. But I don't have like $120,000 probably to buy that piece. <laughs> so that's the one out of my reach. What about you guys? Uh, the cover to Witchblade number five. Iconic image. Um, I'm sure Frank has it in his private collection, or maybe some, or maybe some other guy has it out there. Yeah, it's we'll very possible, but I'm sure if I was like, "Hey, would you want to sell it?" Either I would get a, you know, fuck no, <laughs> or thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked. Yeah. What about you, Drew? I guess money, no object, and assuming that the owners were willing to part with any of them, I think the the few things that I would really love is again, Dave Cockrum's cover to X-Men 102, which is on comic art fans. It's there to look at, uh, Arthur Adams cover to classic X-Men number one, which is also, uh, there for the, the viewing pleasure. If you like beyond those, I mean, you know what, as funny as it sounds, uh, you know, the infinity gauntlet covers, infinity war covers. So they're great, but I, you know, it's not like I would go crazy trying to get one, uh, because again, those are it's, that's newer stuff that I love, not the older stuff. But yeah, probably the uh, the, the X Men One Hundred Two cover is probably my top thing that I would love if I could afford it, which I won't be able to. But uh, but that's probably it. Was there anything else that anyone wanted to chat about, Phil? I know you came in prepared as you did last time with a whole with pages of notes. So, is there anything that we didn't get to that you wanted to you know, discuss? I, I think we just be able to answer everything very organically throughout this process, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Definitely enjoyed it immensely. Cool. Um, I know I talked about this. Like, what? Like, what's your favorite piece? You know, Phil Drew. Yeah, that you guys own. That you guys own. Well, you talked about the pit, pit and then of course, actually the Thanos annual number one cover too by Dale Keown. Um, it, it's just I own a Dale Keown cover, like you know, for the, as terms of a bragging rights, it doesn't get better. I don't have a Hulk, but it's okay. He drew me actually a sketch for free, so that's my prized possession. And then just the Thanos annual cover, that's my. Own. Yeah, I guess for me, from a, for a commission, my favorite is a, a two-page splash that I got from Ron. It was a, a 30th birthday gift from my uh, my parents has like 31 different characters on it. It's just a, a really nice piece. So that, again, has sentimental value, but I just really like it. Ron did a great job on it. And I guess from a published page perspective, probably Infinity Gauntlet 5, page 40, which is a splash page, last page of issue 5, with uh, Thanos front and center with Doctor Strange, Silver Surfer, and Warlock, and then Gamora with the Infinity Gauntlet. So, uh, again, if Warlock shows up in the movies and everything and somehow... Mar- you know, Marvel gets the Silver Surfer back from Fox. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that's a page plenty of people will be asking me about. Saying, "Hey, you want to sell it?" But uh, not going to, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, for me, I have much less to choose from <laughs> than you guys. But uh, from the the pieces that I have, I mean, that Darwin Cook Green Lantern. I mean, that's definitely up there. And then that Francis Manipal uh, Superman one, because that was full body with a background painted. Um, and as yeah, I'm, Superman's my favorite character, so that's that's definitely up there. And all my stuff is is hanging, which is funny because I had you know they were all in sketchbooks except for the Superman. That one I had done separately because I knew I wanted to hang that up. 
But the rest were in the sketchbook. But then it got to the point where, since I kind of cooled on it, I was like, I don't foresee myself filling up the rest of this anytime soon. So I might as well at least get some enjoyment out of the ones that I have. So I actually had Steph, she cut them out of this. Uh, I couldn't do it myself. Uh, I couldn't do it. And I couldn't even be in the same room while she was doing it. <laughs> but she did a great job. And we framed everything and, and put it up. And, and I do enjoy looking at them. Um, though I do get where you guys are coming from as far, and your stuff is a lot more valuable, so it makes sense that you would want to keep it that way. But it's cool because for a long time I had them in the book, and then for the past couple of years I've had them up. Uh, and it is cool, you know, just getting to see them, uh, you know, every day like that. What about that Phil Hester Green Arrow? Yeah, that's up there too. That's I love that piece as well. Yeah, that was one of the first ones I got. You wouldn't have got that without me because you wouldn't have gone to the Top Cow booth. <laughs> that's right. I got you that sketch ticket. Yeah, Ooh, you that. did. It's good. It's good to have, you know, friends that are you know deep into this no it does help tremendously look like i said at the top i mean you know you and i went to michael's together and, and you told me what sketchbook sketchbook to get so um yeah i definitely recommend if you're looking to get into this if you know somebody who can kind of show you the ropes uh it definitely goes a long way so is there anything else anyone would like to say or talk about no nope buy what you like that, that's definitely exactly buy yeah. what you like buy what you like don't worry about what anybody else is collecting and You'll enjoy it. Do it for you. Stay composed. Do not go overboard, please. Well, on that note, I thank all of my guests for uh, what I think has been a really illuminating conversation about this. I think anyone who has any interest in whether they already collect original art or they are looking to get into it, I think there's a lot for them to, you know, to kind of process from what we've talked about. So uh, thank you to you guys. Thank you to everyone who listened. Please keep listening. And until next time, don't be a flat squirrel. My Comic Shop History is a Flat Squirrel production. Please visit flatsquirrelproductions.com to explore my other projects, including My Comic Shop Documentary, By Spoon, The Jay Mizell Story, and the forthcoming Wacky Man, The Rise of a Puppeteer. Be sure to subscribe to My Comic Shop History on iTunes and catch up on Season 1. Like My Comic Shop History on Facebook and follow me on Twitter at Desi Westside. Likes, ratings, and reviews are always greatly appreciated. Thank you for listening and continuing to support this show.